we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. and welcome to the Thursday night edition of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us as we got a great show on alien abduction. Susan Alloway is here along with MUFON's Earl Gray Anderson and his goatee is looking fantastic, just so you know. It really is. And we're glad to have them here. Dirty Filth is here with another cartoon. And the best part, all of you are here as well, including Tim Mothman and his goatee in the gold medal position. Deborah Rooney with a silver, race fan with a bronze medal tonight, Hi Woopoo, Robert Lamoth, Michael Morris, Dino Bravo, and Roy Boy, good to have you all here. Karen in the Woo Train, Parasolo is here. Parasolo will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Brown Dwarf, Eternity Eternal, Steny, Stephanie Kenny Blankenship, nice to see you all. Ozzy Ozzy, Cosmic Joe. Hi, John Lamb and Sandy B. Good to see you all. Sasquatch Guy, Flat Six, Lisa C, Wild Berry. Thank you for all coming on in. Human Carl is here, not to be misconstrued with Alien Carl, but Human Carl is a great veteran of the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service, Human Carl. We love you. And Mama Catherine, mwah! I love you, my dear. I hope you're doing well, and we'll see you in three weeks. Get my hug in three weeks. Guaranteed. All right, moving on, let's say hello to, let's see, scrolling on down, everybody there having a chat, Ozzy Ange is back, Kurt M, thanks for dropping on in, Jennifer, good to see you, hi, Laura Lobs, Melvin from Mars, Phineas Coathanger on X, how you doing, my man, Phineas will be signing autographs after the show as well, line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Millennium, my man, thank you for coming on in as we continue on with our roll call here. There's Dirty Filth, Operation Shutdown. Esteban Herdez, how you doing? Welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us for the first time. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show. Hi, Noble Patrick, John Loban, Lee the Bee, Vanessa, Nikki in Seattle. Thank you for coming on in. Al Garay over on Twitch, just finishing up three sets of bench press at 400 pounds. Good for you. Good for you, man. Corey, Troy, SR71, and Gory Tiger, thank you for joining us. Hi, me, Woiken. And who's next on our list here? Richard Elmore and Ukrainian Anita. Thank you for coming on in. Let's scroll on down. Good morning to you, Ian McFadden over in the UK. Gizmo, per purple-haired Pixie Lara. Chris, silent listen. Good to have you all here. Wow, lots of people in this uh, morning here or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. River Morris, good to have you here. Deborah Rooney kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Thank you very much, Deb. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on a nightly basis. So thank you very, very much. Enrique, welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us. Nina Williams and the gorgeous and talented Kira. How are you guys? Thank you for coming on in. Super Ben from UFO Garage. This man actually does wear a cape. Yes, he does. Flowing hair, the thin, muscular body, and that cape that allows him to fly. That's why we love Super Ben from UFO Garage. All right. Aaron Baca, thanks for coming on in. Cosmic Joe, thank you for that wonderful super chat. Very much appreciate your love and support, Joe. 
very, very much. Hi, Mama Susan. And who's next? Let's see here. Scrolling on down. Well, we got to get the other side started. Christine Lynn, thank you for coming on in. Let's get the radio side started. Hello and welcome to the podcast and radio side of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Tonight, Susan Alloway, Earl Gray from Murph MUFON are here to tell Susan's alien abduction story. A true encounter indeed. It's going to be amazing tonight as Bill WD-40 has entered the chat room and lubing us up for tonight's show because you always want to go into a show nice and smooth. You don't want that rigidness. You need that smoothness, and Bill, that's why he lubes it up every night for us. So thank you, Bill. Pissing me off, Evan Walters, but that's a good man. All right, and we are caught up there. Want to remind everybody you could shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. No ugly swag. You can actually go out in public and be proud to wear our clothing. So go check it out on our website. Do me a favor, everybody. Throw those horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a power show of fun tonight. If you want to know about what it's like to have alien abduction, Susan Alloway is here, along with MUFON investigator Earl Gray Anderson, who investigated her case. Then in hour number three, Steve Stockton from Among the Missing. Then Robin Haynes comes in for the cryptid report. It's Dave 101 night and the weird news of the week. Susan Alloway is a multimedia artist that lives in Northern California. At just 17 years old, she joined the United States Navy right out of high school. So thank you for your service, Susan. She is also a lifelong UFO ET experiencer. It was September 1978, the day she was honorably discharged from the Navy, that she and her friend Karen left on a road trip across country from San Diego to Charlotte, North Carolina. While crossing the deserts of Utah late at night, they had a missing time encounter that would alter the course of their lives. Earl Gray is here as well. He's a MUFON investigator from Southern California. He actually looked into Susan's amazing case. So we're actually going to get two different sides of this same story. Susan as the experiencer, Earl as the investigator. And I'm very excited to have both Susan and Earl on Spaced Out Radio. <laughs> Earl, Susan, welcome for the first time. Now, for our radio audience who doesn't know, Susan is actually someone who is in our YouTube chat room each and every yeah. night here listening to the show. And so it's exciting when we can bring not only a family member from our <laughs> chat room in to tell their story, but this one's amazing. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Hey there, Dave. Hi, Susan. Good to hey. see you. <laughs> now, how did you two meet? Shall I leave? I'll leave that to you, Susan. That's that's you kind leave, of your really? story. Well, it's it's um, it all started with John Yost's movie, um, Alien Abduction Answers. I watched it and something just clicked. I called John. I ended up um, talking to a few other people, which I'll tell in the story later. But um, then I called Preston Dennett, who has also been a guest on this show, and is one of my dear friends. And 
I found him so interesting because um, as a researcher, and he has a lot of books, I just found him to be so honest and um, interesting. So I reached out to him, and he put my story in his book. And then um, in this book, and I'm chapter 19, and then um, I reached out to MUFON because I knew that Preston was part of MUFON and had no idea about Earl about Earl Gray Anderson and um, one night I was watching Preston's show and Earl was on and he mentioned jackrabbits a case that had jackrabbits that came across his desk and I was in the chat and I said oh those are my jackrabbits and that's how we met Earl and I <laughs> that's true so, yeah that it was, was all and I, I, I do have to correct Dave just a little bit. I, I'm not actually the person that investigated Susan's case. Oh, I thought you, I thought I'm, you I'm were. state director here. So I have a team of field investigators that uh, I assign cases to. Every now and then I'll take a case myself. Actually, right. when I, I saw your case come in, Susan, I was very, very very at it and i'm seeing all of these markers uh you know and, and if you do experience your cases that that's what you look for you look for commonalities but they're always they're always their own uh significant and and, and different cases right I, I think that our visitors uh that they know the way we think they know our psychology and and so they'll manifest in a way that's usually in a way that's not going to uh, scare us terribly to where, you know, we, we, we are, are, you know, fight and flight or something like that. Um, but, but anyway, uh, but I saw the case come in and I have a field investigator, uh, Richard Benazak, who's, uh, uh, he was a 30, uh, he was a police, uh, detective for over 30 years. And, uh, and Richard had recently joined the experience resource team which is our kind of MUFON's high strangeness wing. We, we take care of, uh, we're, we're a resource actually. We're almost like social workers for people who have gone through abduction or visitation uh, scenarios. So uh, anyhow, Richard, I knew his wonderful work. He's, he's just a very, very good thorough field investigator. You know, he has one foot there and sort of the nuts and bolts side. But what I found about him uh, through dealing with people and, he, and Richard, you know, he considers himself a public servant and that's the way that he saw his work for the police department, you know, that he worked for in San Diego, California. So he has a propensity for just having a great compassion for people and empathy up through the rafters. So I, I felt it was almost like directed. It, it just seemed like, you know what, this is, I'm, I'm going to give this to Richard, but I'm at that point in, in, in Richard's uh, arc of, of, of being a field investigator, I was still kind of watching over his shoulder. He was sort of new with the ERT group. So I, I told him, I said, you know, I want you to treat this case sort of like you would a police detective, but also, you know, with, with you know, the compassion and the empathy that we have towards experiencers. And he, he, he was just a shilling for Susan's case. I, I think, I mean, you guys talked, the first interview went like five yes, hours. five it? hours. It was like a long, long interview. That, that's not protocol, but that and was many Richard. Times. And, you know, and, I would- And I would, many, many times after. Yes. <laughs> and I knew he would do that. <laughs> and I would call him up and I'd get reports from him. And I, I let him know. I said that I, I believe this case is a very important. It's going to it's going to be one of those cases that you're going to hear about for years, like Travis Walton and some of the other, you know, the Pascagoula, Calvin Parker case and things like that. Just uh, something very memorable about it and something very personal about it. And uh, so that's kind of the, the the way that I played into this case with with. Susan. Uh, so I wasn't technically the investigator, but I was kind of the, the field investigator, kind of over Richard's shoulder watching and, and seeing the way that it went. 
the first time that we met though is she she heard me on uh, Preston's radio show and I you know I think Preston asked me if we had any interesting cases recently <laughs> of course you know I brought your case up Susan because one of the most interesting <laughs> cases I've seen in a month of Sundays yeah Aww. so that, that's kind of where I played in with us <laughs> And a lot has happened since then. I mean, I don't know how many times we've done podcasts now. I think this is four, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I do believe that MUFON, there's a, there's a, a very well-founded rumor that this may be a mega case of the year for 2024 at MUFON. <laughs> uh, I'm not oh, really at liberty to say it is, but yeah, a, little, a little big foot maybe hooted that at me, right, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> It's always Bigfoot giving up the secrets, Earl. It always is. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's not. It's not those darn little people or the dogmen, you know, or the or the garbage <laughs> who are about to come out. No, it's always the Bigfoot, the, the sly sons of guns. That's exactly it. We're gonna get to your case at the bottom of the hour when we come back from the break. We still got a lot of time before we go, then, Susan. But I mean, you claim to be a lifelong UFO and ET experiencer. When did you tap into the idea that this was happening to you? Was it the case we're going to talk about in a little bit or, and then you kind of started remembering more or was it just something that you've known since childhood? Oh, I've, I've always known since it started happening. I, I, I believe I was four. I could have been maybe three, but I, I remember it like in the old house, the first house we lived in. And then after we moved and started school around five or six. So I have a pretty good timeline and I'm thinking it was around four and five. And um, I would see weird things outside the window because we lived in the South and, you know, the windows were open all the time and there was a screen and, you know, the crickets and the noises and that would get real quiet. And then the head would pop up and, you know, I would always, sleep upside down so I could look through the hallway at the front door because my dad was a police officer and I knew when he came home. Uh, when I heard it, I would always see him. But this night, there was a weird face. The first time I remember this happening was to the left of me in the window. And then in the window, you know how there's three windows at the top of the door, of the front door, and it was up in the tallest one. And I did that little, even at four, this little tactical maneuver of flipping off the bed and then crawling into the hallway, scared to death that it would see me because it was so creepy, big head, big eyes. And it was kind of, since it was dark, it was kind of glowy, but not from a light hitting it from, uh, from inside. It was just glowy. And that was the freaky part. And I remember the next morning um, after climbing back in bed, I went to the bathroom and went right past my parents' room. Um, and I don't know why I didn't stop until I was just like paralyzed in fear and just went under the covers because, you know, at that age, you just, when you go under the covers, every nobody can see you and everything is fine. So that's how I used to handle it. And then once we moved, um, which I was four or five into a new neighborhood and um, I, I would wake up in the yard a lot with my little pajamas on and just come back in the door and go to bed because people really didn't even lock their doors back then and used to keep your key over the visor in the car so it was much safer and um, I kind of thought that it happened to everyone I and one of the things it's funny because my brother was with me one time that we had a big rope swing that hung from a big oak tree in the backyard and it had a, a two by four on it with a hole through it and a knot on the bottom to hold the board. So as it hung down, it just curled up. So the board was up here and it made like a J. And I remember watching it rise and there was always that feeling of this magnetic, um, like static electricity, but it, it it was noticeable even then, but I thought everybody noticed it. So I looked at my brother and he was about six or seven and he looked at it and he, he was kind of um really still. Like if you were to look at it, you know, you would think it was odd and you wouldn't just be still, but he was like still. And then when I asked him, did you see it? He 
shook his head no, and he crossed his arms and, nope, didn't see it. Which, you know, he became a cop for 37 years, so I kind of think he had that same mentality even when he was seven. It was like, nope, don't see it, don't get it, don't understand, no answer for it. So, um, things just continued on, so I've always been aware of them, Dave, always. I was very conscious, even uh, even on camping trips, um, a little thing with Bigfoot. It, I was so conscious of all of it. And the only time that I didn't remember in my life was that nine hours that happened that I'm going to talk about tonight. I, and, and it's really weird because at some time I do remember remembering. I do remember knowing. But I just tuck, tucked it away for 45 years because I was fearful for my family and for my life and, you know. Right. And, and I want to ask you about that fear, okay, that you've had in touch in talking about this subject overall. And once again, we're going to get to the experience when we come back from the break at the bottom of the hour. But for people who may not know what that fear is, what's it like, Susan? Um, well, you keep, you, you, you stash that in the back of your mind in that little drawer along with the things that have happened. Once you discover that everybody else is not having them. So as you get older, you're just kind of used to it. And, but at the same time, when you pull it out to look at it, such as the times when I would find an article uh, or I would find Bud Hopkins' book or I would see Whitley's, you know, weird face on the front of his book, all those years that I stashed it, I also paid attention to it. And the fear would almost seize you. But the worst part was the block that was in your mind because I could not talk to my friend, Karen, that this happened with. And that is where a lot of the fear came from, is the fact that I was, it was like right on the tip of your tongue, but you couldn't say it, you couldn't speak it. And when you tried, it would just go, uh, 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 and you just you can't say it. And that caused a lot of, of fear. So I would just stash it again. But the other fear came from hearing People like Travis Walton, once you report it, it is out of control. There is no more, the spoken word is very strong. There's no more taking it back. And I was always afraid to cross that line and tell anybody. I told my husband of 35 years, my kids knew, my closest friends knew, but when I told them it wasn't discussed, they listened. And then we went on to another subject because nobody was comfortable with it. And I try to throw it out occasionally and, you know, here and there and no, nope. it's almost like they didn't know what to say. And then that caused more fear of what if they find out this is real until it came to the point of there's no more keeping it quiet. And the fear went away once I started speaking it and it got a little bit easier and a little bit easier. I had hypnosis. I talked to John Yost. The fear was at a maximum during me watching his movie and oh, yeah. I, I was in a fetal position on the floor the first 17 seconds because he talked about how you have to lie your whole life to cover it up. All and, and, right, and right there, I just want to get Earl's reaction because Earl, you've been with MUFON for a long time now. You've discussed this fear with a lot of people over those experiences that you have heard and and susan hits the nail right on the head the lie you have to tell to people yeah. because you know they're not going to believe you they know they're going to throw you under the bus what's that like dealing with people yes. and, and going through that psychological aspect of this all well it's called ontological shock and that's the way that this hits you when, when you've had an experience like Susan had. Um, and, and many of us, of course, that are in, you know, research in this field, we're in this field because we've had our own experiences. And I, I'll say that uh, when I had uh, my own experience, uh, I told my state director and he, he was kind of more nuts and bolts about this stuff. 
since then he's he's had some experiences of his own and he's he's kind of loosened up on that but uh back then uh I, you know i got kind of a raised eyebrow and it's like oh god you know great my new field investigator says you met a Billions, wonderful, just what I want, you know, and how convenient for you, you know. Uh, and and I'll tell you, I clammed up. The only people that I, I, I was afraid to tell anybody else, I felt like I needed to tell him. Uh, and my own wife, you know, it was very difficult for her to deal with it. Uh, she's one of those where the, you know, even though she had uh, an experience two nights after mine, it was very, very similar uh, all she remembers is the our house flooding with light, even though uh, in the moment right afterwards she remembered it and she was very aggravated and upset about it. You tend to just not tell people. Um, you know, MUFON is a very well-respected organization. It started out pretty much as a nuts and bolts organization, still to a certain effect is, you know. Uh, now, uh, it's, again, you know, even MUFON, I mean, this is part of the phenomenon uh it's not just the hot rods it's the drivers of the hot rods that we see right <laughs> and uh and that to me that's the most uh, the beating heart of ufology is finding out well who is visiting us and where are they coming from and what are their motives and uh but when you have your own experience you you do just you you stuff that down uh there's a ridicule factor out there and also, so many people are left with this compelling feeling that I'm not supposed to talk about this. Almost okay. like you're given this, this subtextual order by the entities themselves to, you know, don't talk about this. Sometimes, you know, people, experiencers will be told this verbally, you know, to not talk about it. So um, that is definitely a, a reaction we see. And I've, I've, I had it myself. It took me a few years before I was willing to talk about my own experience. I would only tell new field investigators because I felt like they, I owed them that caveat that if you poke at the phenomenon, it, po it pokes back sometimes. <laughs> so, but that was it. You know, I wasn't going on the radio talking about, you know, my own experience. And so we're very, very familiar with that. That's a thing. Well, and Earl, one of the big things about the experiencer is, when they, they they have nowhere to hide even even the majority of ufology has turned on them right now the way we're going with nuts and bolts and and mm. the government aspect of disclosure arrow, <laughs> arrow whatever it may Nothing be here, folks you know people are in this community or entering this community because they've had an experience don't know where to turn anymore where, where do you go yes there's move on it, but that's not friendship. That's reporting. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a rarity. You and Susan have become friends over this. But that's a that's a, a small percentage of time. Because you can't emotionally invest in every single person as much as we want to. Okay? But how do you deal with that? Where does a person turn when they can't find the strength around them? There are support groups out there. There's groups like Opus that, you know, Les Velez yeah. and, and Yvonne Smith run. Uh, I know Kathleen Martin and, and Maddie Tobias and some other folks, uh, Gwen Farrell. There, there are support groups for people now that are experiencers. Thank God. <laughs> that wasn't very common back, you know, nine years, eight and a half years ago when I went through this myself. Um, but there is help now, and 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 MUFON itself has the ERT. You know, if if you go to MUFON.com, you know, there's two buttons you can push: report a UFO or report an abduction or an entity. And if that's what you've uh, you've gone through, uh, then you click on that button, and you'll get somebody like myself or like Richard who took you know Susan's case. And uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, there's a lot of resources now that there used to not be. And, and that's the main gist of, of what I try to get out there is that you're Earl, not alone. Earl, on right there. We're going to go to break here. Earl Gray from MUFON, Susan Alloway, Experiencer, Susan Story, coming up next on Spaced Out Radio. We'll be right back, everybody.
Good start, everybody. Good start. Yeah. All right. Right on, Dave. That Am I so out camera? I'm, oh, I'm going to I'm going to run to the bathroom here real quick if I can. Yeah, Drinking no problem. Too much bro. water, I think. Yeah, <laughs> right All right, I'll be right back. All right. Hi to Silent Listen, and who else has joined us here? Mm, I don't know. I'm going to sneeze. Oh, I saved it. I saved it. Mm, I saved it. Mm, good. I hate sneezing. Hate sneezing. Oh. Mm -hmm. So can anybody hear me right now? Yeah, the YouTube and our podcast can hear you. Well, I want to say hello to everybody there on YouTube in the chat because I can't get to chat. But I see you all and I see your questions and I love you guys. You're all my tribe. I tell you. You, you ask Dave, where do you go? This is where you go. And this is where you meet great friends because I have met some dear friends through the chat that are probably going to be friends my rest of my life. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Sure. I mean, it's true. I've met so many people and not just here in the chat, but had them, they're in my life now. And it's wonderful. I really like that. And deep friendships over this subject. Beautiful. I, I'm so excited. <laughs> I wanted to, when, when you told me you wanted to come on the show and talk about this, I was like, these are the stories that I love doing this show about. It's those personal aspects that people go through and where, you know, you feel the emotion, you feel the, uh, the, the sense that you can picture it in your mind. What happened. It That's was your I, day 101. Your day 101 did it. And I'll tell you exactly the day that I knew I needed to. You said, where are the new cases? Where are the new stories? Where are the interesting stories like Travis Walton? And you named them all. And it's after Earl had said that other statement that this paralleled those cases. And that's when I just heard it, my call to action. And it said, in time, I need to be on the show because then I'll just show Dave because this is quite extraordinary what's getting ready to happen. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> ah, it's perfect. But yeah. but you know what? That, that, is, that is a strong thing, though. I mean, due to the Internet where anybody can share their story now, there really isn't a, a, a good opportunity for people to have that story blow up anymore like right. Travis or like Pascagoula or or right. Betty and Barney and or the Andreasons or whoever you know I mean it's yes. just there everything is just yes. there you know and it's tough it really is tough when you're all you're doing is you're like damn like where's the next one when's the next good movie about alien abduction going to come out <laughs> and whose story is it going to be before Hollywood butchers it yeah. And, and, and really cool stuff that I'll tell you is still happening. It's still, I'm still getting information and it still amazes me what comes around. Um, it, it, the information just comes to you out of nowhere. Uh, ancient aliens and I'll, I'll, I'll mention yeah. all that. It's so odd that after all these years, after finally telling it, the answers are really coming around. So, I don't know what the hell is happening with me right now. I'm, I'm like, you know, I feel like it, it's, it's going to happen again soon, but I'm not prepared. Uh, it, it always happens when you're not prepared. <laughs> That's so true. You, you, you can't prepare for, for. Yeah. I mean, people that are contactees, people that have had, uh, you know, contact episodes in their life, they seem to follow a person through their entire. Oh, yeah life and you look yeah. back at your childhood i know that susan has and we all have i have you know and there there's some you know strange things when i from when i was a child and now i kind of go i wonder if you know you know there yeah. are a couple of you know miraculous times when i probably should have fallen off of the cliff or this should have happened or <laughs> but uh, right. it seemed like uh, there was another hand in there and you know, I would think of it as God, and I still do. But I think God has uh, God has His helpers, and 
you know, I'm, I'm not ruling ETs out as, as some of those, <laughs> you know, but I think, you know, it runs in family, it runs in families, it runs in certain bloodlines. Uh, there's markers that we find and, and uh, it does seem to follow families, military families too. And how interesting right. that Susan's right, father. Guys. Hold that, hold that thought Earl. I apologize. Thank you to Deb. <laughs> Joe and W. Decker, we're going to come back here in three seconds. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate you tuning us on in wherever you are in this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone. And don't forget, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on any major podcast network as well. Follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Susan Alloway and Earl Gray Anderson are here talking about a 1978 experience of missing time with Susan Alloway. Susan, thank you very, very much. And we're going to, Earl, no offense. I'm going to take, let Susan take over the reins here for a second. <laughs> it's and, her show. <laughs> and, and Susan, take us back to September, 1978. You just got out of the United States Navy and you and your friend were about to embark on a cross country tour from California all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, probably had a date with Ric Flair and the four horsemen back then. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, what happened yeah. there? So um, we left really early in the morning, super early in the morning, um, the day I'd gotten out and we just happened to be driving a car we'd never driven before. Uh, one of the officers at my uh, last assignment had asked us if we would drive his brand new Volvo across country to North Carolina to Raleigh. Um, because he was getting ready to get out and he already had two cars and he and his wife would be driving and he needed someone to drive this rather than ship it. So, um, and he gave us $1,500. So of course we said, yeah. And we packed everything in there, everything that, to camp, everything, you know, if we need anything that we could possibly need a whole lot of food and ice and just every kind of preparation. And um, we had had a friend fill out um, a, a trip. It's called a trip tick through the AAA. So we had a big map and everything circled of where we wanted to go. All of our friends were lined up going cross country that we were going to stop during because we had three weeks to get there. So in fifteen hundred dollars, that's a lot back then um, and no schedule whatsoever. So we headed. We left Imperial Beach to where we lived together down there when um. I had gotten out of the service, me and my friend Karen, and we had headed up towards Flagstaff and then um, saw the south rim of the Grand Canyon and toured the whole east side. Um, there was a lot of red rock and it's kind of like where Fred Flintstone would live. It's just red boulders um, and up to the north part of the canyon, uh, up to St. George, where I think we had probably i'm pretty sure we were going to stay there but we just felt invigorated and were not ready to 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 stay for the night and we went on up to cedar city and filled up with gas and it was nine o'clock at night right before everything closed um and i remember cedar city because it's about four thousand feet and for some reason there was an amazing sunset unforgettable you know purple and gold it was just really amazing but it was 360 like we were it's it felt like we were on the peak and there was a 360 sunset which is odd to start with because you're not ever going to see a 360 sunset but oh well we were having a good time didn't we just kind of stashed that so we started headed north into um up the highway and 15 north 
met 70 and then it went in we were going to go to grand junction and it was circled we've been keeping our mileage uh, i remember we had um katie lied steely dan on the radio and blasting the windows were down and it was a full moon that's why we were excited about driving in the desert um, and we had camped for years together karen and i we traveled well we we were just good travelers together so she was driving and the moon came up to the east over the mountains and it was up a little bit over the mountains it was so bright that um I remember saying, turn the lights off. Let's drive with no lights. Let's just drive in the shadows, to which it was so bright because the stars were all out. It was just dark, dark, dark with the moon and it all lit up. And so we were just having a good time. And I, would, I had mentioned to Karen about um, seeing these really cool jackrabbits before on a trip months before. I hope we see some of those cool jackrabbits. That's exactly how it was said. And out of the blue, it must have been about 20 minutes. The moon had come up. And then all of a sudden, I noticed the moon was missing. And then the stars were missing. And I remember my whole body sticking out of the car, you know, looking up, looking back, laying the seat back, crawling to the other side. Maybe it's gone down past the mountains to the west, but, you know, that that is just ridiculous makes no sense it just came up so i was starting to feel something just totally wasn't right and i remember saying maybe we need to find some kind of pull out and stop and try to find out where the moon is because the moon doesn't just go away it's a full moon we've been driving in the moonlight trying to make sense of it and then the stars are gone too pitch dark and then we just stop Karen just stops on the highway, not on the side of the road, but on the, on the highway. And she stopped because there were about 30 giant jackrabbits on the highway in front of us. They were about three and a half feet tall. And who knows why we opened the doors and got out and walked to the front. Because remember, it was pitch dark by then. No moon, no stars, our lights. On the highway, it was just two-lane road then. It's a four-lane now, but it was only two-lane then. And all those jackrabbits, and they were all looking away from us. But they were jackrabbits with big, huge ears. They were jackrabbity bodies and jackrabbits. So um, all of a sudden, the this big white light came down. Pure white, brightest white light you've ever imagined. And the music went silent, the lights went off, the car went off, total silence. And the jackrabbits who were looking away from us just all turned around like this and were staring uh, at us. And I think I sent you that picture, Dave, um, of all of them in the road staring at us. It just seized your heart. And at that split second, the last thing I remember is reaching for Karen with my left hand kind of grabbing her like a sack of potatoes. Like you grab a child when you've stopped the car really quick and you grab something to keep it from spilling or falling over. And then at that split second, we woke up in a diner in Grand Junction, Colorado, almost 400 miles away, asleep on the table and um, a waitress woke me up and she said uh, it's time to wake up honey but you know just motherly sweet and I looked at her like where the hell are we and who the hell are you and Karen rose up and we're covered in radiation burns and nauseous and um, scared but so stunned that you couldn't be emotional. Like we weren't like, where are we? We weren't like that. We were just numb. I look at the clock and I asked her, what time is it? And she told me 6.28 in the morning, 6.28 a.m. They were serving breakfast. The place was starting to fill up. We were in one of those round booths just looking at each other like, why are we here? 
how did we get here? And we couldn't respond. We couldn't ask each other questions. We could only say things like, where are we? Why are we here? There's nothing else that would... It was just a total block in your brain. All you, It was just the worst feeling because you had no idea. And, you know, you're... you're analyzing it all quick 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 but yet you're so numb and kind of in a coma that it it's frustrating and it gives you major anxiety i remember we ordered dr pepper and um we we were just sick and she told us we had been there about 10 minutes uh before she woke us up and that she told us that karen was driving and she just we just pulled in that she just saw us pull in so we were in the car and we did walk in, but don't even have any member, memory of that. And then the next thing is we went to a hotel, which we also have no memory how we got there, but we had to have driven the car in that weird coma, which is scary to even think about that. And we ended up in this weird hotel to where um, it was kind of like old cinder blocks. But remember, it was 1978 and it was like old just an old desert hotel because we were in the middle of nowhere it wasn't all developed back then and I remember trying to take a shower but my skin burned and blisters were starting to come up just with the big red welts and the, the just the sickness I can't even explain and Karen had laid down on the bed and I just remember just wrapping a towel around me and getting up behind her and holding her because I was scared to death what has happened to us and I don't want her to get away from me because I'm um I, she was like my lifeline we were like each other's lifeline there was no explanation nobody to ask the car was out front nothing else seemed odd except how did we get from outside of Cedar City, which is, there was a little town called Enoch, and it was right around, I remember seeing Enoch. So that was the last town. And it was about 360 miles, I believe. And when we woke up the next morning, we, we slept that entire day, the entire day. Couldn't speak, couldn't eat, just kind of numb. And I remember looking at the um, the map, knowing that, and we tried to talk about, you know, okay, so this is supposed to be the plan of what we're supposed to be doing today, even though we wanted to talk about what had just happened, but all I could remember is falling from the sky. I could remember falling from way up through the layers of atmosphere and seeing the sun come up through the low valleys between the peaks of the mountains and it would light up the desert floor and the red rocks and I was watching that as I was coming down and I think that's where I got burned because I remember feeling my skin sizzle it was just on fire and I couldn't even speak that then to Karen we couldn't really speak about anything except going forward nothing behind us until we got out to the car and then we f figured our mileage looked we still had a full tank of gas and we were missing 360 or so miles on the odometer the car had had to been transported with us because it did not take that trip on the road wow well and at least they didn't drop you off in the middle of oh. tumbler ridge british columbia you know See, it's, I mean? the, it's the truth they're in the middle of the desert we were together um I remember telling her about it. I remember our eyes meeting. It was just still so funky that you just couldn't, there's nothing that's going to, you just can't talk about it. it even trying to explain it would kind of blow your mind. It put this stress on your mind that you feel like you're going to blow up. So we just took off and we went to what we thought was Pike's Peak, but it was Mount, oh, I don't remember the next high, highest peak in Colorado. We went up there. We actually have pictures of that day. We have pictures of the whole trip 
that she sent me this just this past Christmas in, a, in an album that was so sweet. But there was nothing of that fabulous first day, nothing of that night, only after we woke up in the hotel forward. And, I, and it makes me think that I was very aware of making sure that somebody knew what had happened to us every second of the way from then on, because there was no explaining it. And uh, our friends in Denver I was going to go see, didn't go see them because I'm covered, we're covered in radiation burns, and we don't even know how we got uh, to Grand Junction. And how am I going to explain to some of my best friends why we look like total burned out desert rats and burned out desert rats <laughs> and um, dry and um, delusional, strange thoughts, memories flashing. They were flashing like a strobe light in my head. And Karen didn't remember the jackrabbits. But I didn't know at that time that she didn't remember the jackrabbits. She just remembered taking off into the night, the moon going dark, and then us waking up in the diner. That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. And, and, and you know, it, it's weird that you mentioned Grand Junction, Colorado, because we've just started broadcasting there as well on terrestrial radio. So oh. <laughs> there's a little yeah. synchronicity there that is just weird what did you mean by the fact that you felt that you were falling from earth i was i was falling, falling from something i was falling from something above um it was a memory of just falling from the sky i didn't know from what but i remember the actual falling through a real dark space then it went white then it went blue and then it was our atmosphere it was like I so it was like a halo jump with no mask and no parachute. Literally, the scariest part was remembering that, and it would just scare the crap out of me because I was I knew it wasn't a dream, and I remember getting burned, and so that's why I think it. All I can say is I was falling, and I don't know if I was falling, headed towards the car. I don't know where Karen was. It's just an odd memory of falling i think had a little dress on i was just falling just falling to earth i actually drew some pictures of it afterwards and um how did this affect karen we we're hearing your story here but are did this end up killing a friendship did it end up you know tightening tightening up that friendship what do you how did that go well, you know, once I got back to Imperial Beach, we just couldn't talk about it. And uh, she was dating my friend Rick, which is the guy that I had originally seen. He was one of my Navy buddies that I had seen originally with the Jackrabbits. And I didn't know at the time, but I knew something odd had happened that trip. And that was in the Anza Borrega Desert, which is another thing from John Yost's movie, which is exactly when he got enlightened about what had happened to him was in Anza Borrega Desert. So all these little things in the movie keep coming back. And um, since she had a boyfriend and I had a boyfriend, it gave us a cushion because we lived together that we could all cook together but not have to talk about the trip. And if the guys ask about the trip, we could just quick answer, go off to something else. Now, Rick saw us on the trip. We went to Indiana and visited Rick and um, I remember that wearing long sleeves to cover up the burns. And I had this big uh, scoop out of my neck right here. It's an inch, about an inch, and it's a perfectly round scoop. And it has some odd, um, almost like writing in it. I don't, I don't know. But it was a scoop, but it looked like a, like a hickey, you know, like a sex hickey. And I, it was embarrassing, but it was sealed over. The scoop was dark purpley, like black, and like a bruise, but it was scooped out, but smooth, like the skin had already grown over it. There was no bleeding. It never was bleedy or anything, but I would put a Band-Aid or anything over it to, to hide it or wear a high shirt because I was so 
weirded out about people asking about that because of what had happened to us. And I was very aware of what had happened to us. So, Earl, when you hear a case, as we got about four and a half minutes, where you have the nine hours missing going from Utah to Colorado, which is a long drive, these jackrabbits, the missing time, the fact that, you know, there's burns on the skin. When you first hear a story like that, what little points are you looking for? Or the falling from the sky, that's another one. <laughs> I'm familiar with every single thing that Susan just mentioned. I mean, from other cases, uh, you don't always have them all together in the same case, but her case sort of had all the bells and whistles. But I, I had one Navy corpsman that uh, he was taken up. He, he, was, he was on an aircraft carrier. It was his 21st birthday. He was kind of angry that he was spending that, you know, alone with a book in, in, in his barracks. And, uh, and he had this experience of going up through the decks of the aircraft carrier. And he said that he felt each deck uh, physically. And again, he wasn't picked up by a spaceship that was hanging right over the aircraft carrier. He just went straight up to low Earth orbit, and he was he he met these beings there. Uh, he never saw a UFO. Uh, he saw two beings that seemed to be made out of light. They showed him potential disasters that were going to happen on Earth, and then it was like they were waiting to see his reaction. His reaction was one of horror and compassion for humanity, and he said that he felt surrounded by love and then they returned him the same way again you know he said that it was like falling out of the sky uh he said that somehow or another i felt like i physically went right through the decks of the aircraft carrier and there i was in my uh in in my rack again and i have another case where this happened to a marine at camp pendleton uh, up through the roof of his uh of his barracks people can't make stuff up like this and it sounds too absurd uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, by the time, you know, when we got Susan's case, it was maybe six months ago, I think, around there, six, seven months ago, I think. Uh, um, maybe a little longer than that. Yeah. Close to a year. Yeah, it was probably. a little longer. Every single thing that was in her case, I kept on finding markers. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's been close to a year now. Uh yeah. But I remember, I mean, my, Michael Cleland talks about the owls that people see, the, the screen memories. And, and I think our visitors use screen images as well. It'll usually be a deer or owl. But there is a, a lot of reports now. It, it seems like all the rabbit reports are, are starting to, well, once your case came out there, Susan, uh, I, I've had a few people come up and, and, and uh uh, even, even Kathleen Martin brought one to my attention and said, this is another case where somebody saw what they thought were rabbits and then they turned around and it was our little, you know, gray friends with the black eyes. So uh, yeah. uh, it's a very strange, strange case, but uh, weirdly enough, uh, I'm familiar with all of those signs, the radiation burns, all that stuff, the missing time uh, and, and the, the way that time seemed to be almost, uh, dreamlike we call that the oz effect jenny randall's the the uk uh ufologist i think that she first coined that phrase because sort of like in the wizard of oz when dorothy opens the door and suddenly you see all this color and strangeness yeah. that you have never seen before and that that's the way the phenomenon is when you're close up to it uh, it affects you psychologically. It affects you in every single way. And it affects you uh, physically. Earl, Susan, I'm going to get you guys to hold on right there because we're going to talk more about this amazing encounter with potential extraterrestrials by Susan Ware Alloway. Earl Gray Anderson is here from MUFON, California, as well as we are looking into this amazing case on Spaced Out Radio. This is why I do this show is these personal cases. I love them. They scare the hell out of me, but we've got to talk about them. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this, everybody. Stay tuned. This is Spaced Out Radio with Hopes and Scott.
All right, we are back. Dirty filth, let's have a little peeky poo here of what you're looking at. I see the jackrabbits. Mm hmm. <laughs> let's see uh, here. Hold on, let me zoom in on you here. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> Look at that. that Look is at those, so what cool. big eyes you have. <laughs> you got the moon in the floor. Oh, that is so cool. How about Thank that? So I guess you can Seems see that I have the other print from you because this is the gray oh. that I got from oh, you. I love it. That looks familiar. Yes, I love it. I, I honor this. I just think it's so cool. I've never actually seen my art live somewhere else at a different point in the universe at one time. Well, it's sitting beside me tonight with the highway rabbit. I love it. Well, I hope everyone's having a good night tonight. <laughs> really cute. You got the moon and the stars up there. You know, unfortunately, yeah. all the cats have abandoned me. <laughs> really cool. So they they all went for a run. Blob is over there running around. Gremlin gargoyle and no blob sightings tonight. Unfortunately, I see the little UFO that you put in there. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's actually swamp gas. You're mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> That's right before it got so huge. Okay, Ms. Mr. Heineck. Lovely, lovely. Swamp gas is what finally got Dr. J. Allen Heineck to stop, you know, tugging the, the line for the Air Force. He, he got so much grief over that line that they wanted him <laughs> to feed the public that he finally said enough is enough. And no more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Swamp gas, right? Yeah. Are these your? First there wasn't a swamp near. <laughs> Are these your first jackrabbits, filthy? Uh, the first jackrabbits I've ever actually drawn. Yay! You got the oh. first jackrabbits. <laughs> I appreciate your that. Eyes usually don't look like that, though. We we know what's happening. That's they're starting to lose their visage here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of seeing behind the mask, I think, maybe just a little bit there. Look at their creepy fingers. Ooh, the jackrabbit fingers. Not all of them have fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that guy's uh -uh. hiding. Jackrabbits don't have fingers. Ooh, they sure maybe. do. <laughs> It, you know, I I think that you you kind of zipped past that one part that you you know you you've when we've talked about this that you guys kind of saw that they were grays. They didn't remain rabbits. Uh, oh, when, that, in oh. that last well, I, that, moment. Did I say that about they when they turned around? around. Oh, peekaboo! You know what? It's so <laughs> weird in my mind when I'm telling it. It still seizes me up some. Yeah, I get yeah. that. That was the rude awakening when they weren't jackrabbits anymore. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yep. yep. That's, what, um, that's what you said when you first originally wild. talked to me as well. I turned around and looked all grays and jackrabbity and Yeah. And immediately I had just I just this is kind of the idea that came to my mind when I heard all that all at once. It was like one mm. big blob yep. of an idea. And, It's great. I love the little flower there too because it's funny. The it was September, and the um, the reason we wanted one of the reasons we wanted to go through the deserts because it's always blooming, and it was just amazing. So, you got the flower in there. Hmm. Sometimes <laughs> I slip a flower into the room, and that's an oddity in St. George, uh, uh, Utah. <laughs> it's not the. Yeah, it, it does get green sometimes, but that's pretty much yeah. desert, desert there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of the end of the desert. I've been there. 
the, mm -hmm. end, the end of the green and the beginning of when it gets really that's what we were doing is just driving into the desert mm -hmm. film and louise yes well i'm glad you didn't go off the cliff although you guys went to, you did go into space <laughs> <laughs> yeah we did then the uh, final curve Curtain was yeah. shut at the end, thank God, because here we are talking about it all these years later. I know. I um, actually feel blessed every day. There's a certain whimsy to rabbits. Damn rabbits. And if you think about it, it's the most <laughs> docile creature. A rabbit, you know, people aren't, I mean, even an owl is, is technically a raptor. It's a predatory bird. But, but jackrabbits... I mean, unless they're it's two bills during mating season, and that in that situation they'll kind of fight like two kangaroos uh, yeah. for mate. But other yeah. than that, it's the most docile creature, and I think that that's why they picked that. And didn't you mention right. jackrabbits? You were saying that you wanted to see jackrabbits at one point, and I think that they took yeah. that right. screen image from your actual from from your thoughts. They, they, I'm gonna they get you guys to hold on right thoughts. there. I'm going to get you guys to hold on right there. We're back in 15 seconds. Thank you, Deb, Joe, W. Decker, Chris, and Hugh and Carl for the super chats. Hi, IXOXI, Marlena, uh, Jason from UAP Studies. How you guys doing? Sensational Shelly, how are you? Thanks for coming on in. And here we go, everybody. the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Odyssey Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Stool Davey the favor hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nipitatum. Nipitatum is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. We continue on with Susan Alloway, Earl Gray Anderson, as we talk about Susan's amazing missing time and potential abduction experience. Thank you so much for sharing your story on this show, Susan. Sure. And Earl, thank you always for coming on Spaced Out Radio. It's always a blast to have you here. <laughs> My pleasure, Dave. Me too. Susan, you stated that, you know, you you were burnt. You were feeling that you had radiation burns on you. Did you end up getting those checked out by anybody or were you too embarrassed to go to the hospital? No, I knew there was no explanation and there was no way in hell I was going to the hospital. So we went, we, 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 we went to, um, to visit people in Chicago. We rode up to Wisconsin and we got cheese, lots of cheese, rode back down to Indiana, um, visited for about two weeks, all of maybe 10 days coming across. Finally got back to North Carolina and we stayed with my family to which my dad instantly, you know, you could look at us and, and I just wasn't myself. I, but I faked it, you know, and then I, we got Karen back to Atlanta, which is about a four hour drive, um, hung out for a day, spent the night, got her on the plane. And then I came back home, um, and delivered the car in Raleigh. Um, and then I got really sick, more sick than I've ever been. I thought I was going to lose my life. I'm pretty sure that was the radiation poisoning because it just ravaged my body. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't hold anything down, couldn't hold anything in. So sick that my dad just wrapped a big, huge towel around me and he was carrying me back and forth the toilet. My stepmother had a trash can. I was, it was just projectile everything. It was so sick. Dad wanted to take me to the hospital. And I remember holding his face and saying, 
you can't take me to the hospital. You know, I've seen jackrabbits on the highway. We broke up in in Colorado and we've been sick ever since. I've fallen from the sky. I remember I was just crying and trying to explain it to him. And he had sheer terror on his face, just pure horror, because I was his daughter. He loved me, was so proud of me. What the hell's happened to my daughter? So he went, he was a cop, and every little small town has a drugstore, and he went to the, to the drugstore down the street, right down the street from us. Um, they knew each other well, and he brought home some phenobarbital and gave me two big phenobarbital pills to which, you know, all I know is I trusted my daddy and he was going to take good care of me because I was unable to help myself at all. Burning high fever, just burning, like 104, just del delirious, in and out of, uh, of consciousness, but having like in a dream state, weird dream state. So I woke up two days later and he was right beside me and my stepmom was right there um, and I was feeling better. Uh, the pain in the, I had had an awful pain in my right side. It, it was just beyond anything I, I can explain and I'm really glad that my dad gave me those drugs because I think it saved my life. But still denying myself to go to a doctor or a hospital. First of all, I didn't have any insurance after I just got out of service and I hadn't gotten a new job yet. and all of this would have stopped that from happening had I reported it. Plus, I wanted to get back to San Diego and start a new life out of the service. And um, I just couldn't report it. There was no explaining it, and to report it would have brought the police. It would have brought the government, probably. It, it's really hard to say. They probably would have put me in the nut wing and given me massive drugs to calm me down. And I knew that's not what I needed. I just needed to get over whatever had happened. And um, after, I, I wanted to see the fall in North Carolina too. So I remember going back about mid-October. So it was about a month afterwards and I had healed pretty much. The mark had healed. The burns were still red and scaly, but, um, but I was feeling better and it took probably three months to start feeling really normal again because at 22 you know you're like ball busted nothing stops you you're just fearless but I was finding fear because uh, this was a lot to stuff down and hide and not tell and I also you know at, at that age I was pretty dumb about what radiation could do to you but I, little by little, I was getting kind of smart about how sick I had gotten and what it could do to me in the future. And I was worried about having kids and family and all of that stuff. So, um, I, I want to bring Earl in here for a second. Earl, we do not get a lot of cases where there is evidence of radiation burn. Stefan Mikulik in the Falcon Lake incident is one. Rendlesham Forest is another. But we don't usually hear it all. We never heard it from Travis Walton when he got zapped mm -hmm. from that light. And other people who have had close encounters have been uh, beamed down on by these bright lights that are there. Why does this radiation burning seem so, how can I put it, rare? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the Ash Landrum case, that's another one, you know, the whole family had radiation burns. They, they tried to, uh, tried to sue the military. They thought that it, maybe it was a military black project and they, maybe it was, uh, that one hypothesis, you know, as John Jessler's old case. Uh, Terrible. but, uh, you know, we had a case out here. Uh, it was a, in a, in Azusa, California. This was about eight years ago, maybe a little over eight years ago, where there were two women witnesses that had a close encounter with a craft. And uh, and they also reported radiation burns, the blotchy red skin and being sick. And, you know, you do bump into it. It's, it's not like it's not, uh, it's not a rarity. 
But I, I think maybe this is one of the reasons why you don't see UFOs coming right up to people for long periods of time. I think that they probably know that uh, we're sensitive to, to whatever propulsion that they're using. Uh, they seem to keep their distance. When you have a, a UFO right on you, you know, you're usually going to be inside that very soon. And that, that's just been my experience with casework. Uh, yeah. It otherwise, you know, it's usually a distant, you know, fuzzy, you hear that, the fuzzy, you know, photos and all that because it's distant and you have to zoom in. Uh, so maybe they know how fragile we are. Uh, but we do see cases like that. Cash Landrum was one that came, you know, to mind pretty, pretty quickly for me. So. Hmm. Well, I just find those type of cases very interesting. And Susan, getting back to you here. You know, when it comes to your friendship with Karen, has she ever talked publicly about this or is she still clammed up about it? No, she's not clammed up to me about it. And she read, I, I sent her the book, a Preston's book of the story where I had, uh, we had done chapter 19. And she was very proud of me that I had come forward and so excited that it was out by either of us, that it was out. Um, she hasn't come forward publicly, but there's a lot of reasons and, and there's no reason for her to do that right now. Um, uh, but she's proud of me for doing it. And I believe in time she will come forward. She's actually shared it with part of her family. She sent the book out for Christmas and she, and a lot of friends like cousins and stuff. And they, all were totally into it and apparently a lot more people live outside the box than we think so um that was kind of cool but she and i can finally talk to each other and we talk to each other often um and about everything and in 2022 she's the one that finally made me say the word alien grace because i could not say the two words together and when she said, what do you remember uh, when the jackrabbits turned around? And I said, they were not jackrabbits. And she's like, what are they? And I said, well, they were greys. And she said, what? And I said, alien greys. I finally said it. It took all that. It's almost like I had to push my breath extra hard just to get that word out. But once I said it, and tripped over it a little bit, I was okay that now I can say it. So when they turned around, the jackrabbits were not jackrabbits. They were all just alien greys. And um, it took until 2022 to actually say that. And um, I think that too came after I had ha hypnosis um, because I had kept it quiet for so many years and um, once I had hypnosis, it changed everything. It shifted my whole thought about it because not only did I remember remembering what had happened, but I didn't have the fear anymore. So that enabled me to talk about it a little bit more. And Karen and I talk about it all the time. I do believe that she'll come forward one of these days. She didn't mind her name being put into the book. She just isn't public about it, and there's good reason. And in time, I'm sure she will. The good thing is we can talk about it completely. There's no more block. And sometimes we even call each other, and I'll have remembered something, or she will have remembered something. And uh, it was really cool when she sent me the photos of that trip, that, that the whole rest of the trip is exactly how we remembered it. So... Um, it's helped our friendship and we're just back like sisters again. It's really cool. <laughs> a lot of times experiencers, Susan, have the same experience, but they eyewitness different things at the same time. I mean, you take the Phoenix Lights, for instance, as an example, back in 1997, where literally tens of thousands of people witnessed yeah. these craft, but there's still an argument today. Was it a boomerang? Was it a triangle? Was it a giant square flying in the right. sky? Was it just orbs of light? You know, there's still those debates that go on. How close or similar are yours and Karen's stories of the accounts of that day? She doesn't remember the jackrabbits. She doesn't even remember stopping in the road 
It's too bizarre. As a matter of fact, here's our conversation now. She says, you know, Susan, I would have never stopped in the road. I would have seen three foot jackrabbits. I would have just buzzed right through like bump, 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 bump. That's what she said, because no way wow. in her right mind would we have ever stopped. But then I laugh, but yet there's that element of I love the animals, and I'm not sure I would have done that. I probably would have wrecked dodging them, but I wasn't driving. And I know that when we stopped, we were not in our right mind, because nobody stops on the road on the highway at 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night, 9.20, opens the doors and gets out and walks up and we were 10 feet away from them they were right there you just don't do that it's not in a normal mind plus the moon had gone out and the stars gone pitch black there's a whole lot going on there so she doesn't remember it's like they set the stage part. for you in a way yeah, you know it's very dramatic it is and she remembers waking up with how the hell did we get here where are we why are we sleeping, literally sound asleep and looked at each other hmm. with the knowing that we are inside a diner. We didn't drive here. The car is sitting right there. Uh, we both remembered one big giant red mesa out the window, a, a good bit across the street where it was kind of flat on that side. Because I, 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 from what Richard, the investigators figured out too, he called the diners. He's actually found them, uh, two of them that could possibly be it. I was so thrilled. Like I, I even said, "How do you, how do you talk to somebody on the other end about what happened in '78?" And it, they were open, and it's all red inside. And across the street, the picture that Mesa is there. There's just so. Hmm. I, I, he found where we were. It was way on the other side of um, Grand Junction on the east side. So we've had to drive through Grand Junction. That's it, it's insane. You don't remember any of that and you wake up at a table unable to speak about it. So she remembers that completely and she remembers the hotel and she remembers the whole rest of the trip. But she doesn't remember wow. the jackrabbit. And it's, thank goodness, I think it's good that she probably doesn't remember the jackrabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, it, it's weird how that happens because, Susan, I know you've listened to this show a number of times and have heard my experience with Samantha Mowat, who we were just celebrating our 10th anniversary of Aliens in the Forest uh, earlier this week. And I got to tell you, there was one part of that conversation that her and I had. I remember it clear as day. She has zero recollection. And in fact, a number of yeah. years ago, a number of years ago, she actually got mad at me for saying this part on the air, which was when we came out of the forest after the alien encounter, she stated to me, have you ever been abducted before? And I said, no, not that I know of. She goes, okay, well, there's a good chance that it's now going to happen to you. And oh. And four months later, at the end of September, or five months later, at the end of September, that's when I experienced my first alien abduction. And so the, the idea that this happened and that people, and Earl, I'm going to kind of trade off from Susan to you on this, but that people can have the same experience, but experience it differently, like forgetting conversations, not seeing jackrabbits, or whatever it may be. To me, that's one of the weird parts of the alien abduction process, Earl, is that this, it's almost like it's set up, could be days, weeks, months in advance, and yet it's so eerily, I don't even know how to put it, man. I mean, you know, I we we've talked about this before that you know my wife and i had an experience it was a visitation experience and uh she all she remembers is the room flooding with light i remember conversations with her i remember her literally pacing next to the bed going you know earl you need to tell your little friends that they need to leave us that uh, 
alone. I'm not going to use the word on air. Uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't sign up for this, you know, excrement. <laughs> you know? And then, and then, you know, two nights after that, we both experienced a situation where our house was being flooded with light from within, but also outside of our house. It was like this God's own spotlight on our backyard. And my wife was on one side of the window. I was on the other. And uh, we were watching. I mean, there was no way to explain this. And we both received a telepathic message that made us laugh it, 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 because it was a lie. It, but we were both told, and maybe they're trying to calm us down. I don't know. Maybe it's alien humor. But we were told inside of our heads, I know what the you know, I know what telepathic communication sounds like and feels like. Don't worry, it's only a neighbor's porch light. And our eyes meet, and it was so <laughs> absurd and so ridiculous that we started laughing out loud. And we said in unison, that's no porch light. Well, I remember this whole conversation. I remember every single word. And and Lisa gets mad when I tell a story because she all she she remembers the light. And that's it. That's all they let her remember is just our our room flooding with light. And she says, you know, it wasn't normal light. It wasn't coming from, uh, you know, a lamp or, or an illuminating object. It was like the air itself was a glow. Uh, that's all she remembers. And I, I get frustrated with her because she doesn't, you know, it's meaningful when you share an experience like that, especially the telepathy, because I could read her thoughts when we were having this telepathic moment from them. It was like we were one, like this close thing. And also it was this beauty of laughing about something together that was so strange and otherworldly. But uh, sometimes, you know, I, for some reason, uh, one person will remember and the other person, I'm not sure if it's our own minds that blot this out. It may be a human uh, reaction of our own brains that blot something yeah. out that would disturb us that much or, or or, you know, cause ontological shock, which is a form of PTSD. Um, you have to rewrite <laughs> the whole philosophy book when, when you experience something like that. Uh, I'm not sure what the origin of it is, whether it's them or us, but for some reason, people will remember and others won't. It's so weird. Susan, we got two minutes to go before we have to go to break. At the bottom of the hour, Susan Alloway and Earl Gray Anderson are our guests tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Looking back on this, with everything you've learned and, and retrospect and with visions popping into your head, learning more about it, was this a good encounter, a bad encounter, or maybe you still don't know? Oh, I know it was a good encounter because it changed me. It left me with all kinds of, um, I call them superpowers that it's so hard to get used to what happened, but it's also a huge influx of new ways to think. Um, like all the Claire's kind of download all at once, you know, stuff you're not supposed to know. You don't know when you should tell it and what you should say to people because you see things in your head that, affects other people and so you just learn to pick your battles on that and just feel blessed because they they feel like superpowers but at the same time yep. make you feel special it just makes you um, you're just enlightened and you see things that you need to share and let everybody know there's other stuff going on because I, I do want to tell you Dave there's a whole nother part of this that happened in 1989 that I need to tell be next <laughs> yeah we'll get, we'll get into 1989 when we return <laughs> yeah. on yeah. spaced out radio because it's going to be interesting Earl Gray Anderson from MUFON is here as well as Susan Alloway hanging on out alien abduction stories as we continue on Spaced Out Radio right after this. Stay tuned, everybody. We will be right back with the second half of the show coming right up. You're listening. 
listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. All right, guys, clear? I'll be right back. Sure. Okay. I'll vape for a second. <laughs> Since I can. <laughs> What's she breaking some glasses over there? You know? <laughs> Sounded like it. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. You know? Got her tambourine out. Has anybody ever been anybody ever been abducted in the middle of a show? That would be we no. can't find our guest. We're <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. Mm-hmm. But that memory thing is weird, huh? I mean, it's that it is. That's I've experienced it personally, and it's frustrating. Yeah. It's what it is, you know. Yeah. My wife, when I first told our story, she was like, Earl, you're lying. Stop the you know, because she didn't remember right? any of it, you know. Well, Samantha, and it was the most frustrating thing. San- yeah. Samantha. About four or five years later, it was only about two years ago, she came up to me and she goes, Dave, during our experience, did anything happen that I'm just misremembering or got angry about? And I told her about this story and I said, Sam, you absolutely came unglued on me saying that you have no recall and you shouldn't be making things up about this. I said, Sam, I would never do that. I would never do that. And and then all, all of a sudden she's like she's like I figured out that over the amount of time cuz she's a, like you Susan she's a lifelong contactee uh that they had been causing her to say things that she has no recall on. And the funny part about it is Earl when I got abducted on September 30th 2014 when I woke up on the table and when they started operating on the back of my head, if that's a proper term to use, I don't know. I was screaming because it hurt. Then all of a sudden oh. I heard Samantha's voice saying, Dave, don't worry about it. Like I told you, it doesn't hurt. Oh, wow. And, and immediately that pain right in the back of my head, switched over to absolute ticklish. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But they're masters of time, space, and matter. That, that's what I finally realized. And they can put you in any scenario that they think is going to, you know, keep you calm. Or if they want to rile you up. I mean, for me, I think they literally wanted to scare me. It was almost like, you know, I was so naive about it and I was so flip about it. Oh, I think I'm going to do a CE5, but I want, I'm, I'm just going to ask them to, to abduct me if that's the price of the right. ticket, you know? And it was the dumbest thing in the world. And I don't yeah, know, you know if that had anything to do with it, but, but you know, I got what I asked for. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want it when I got it. Uh, I was, I, I, glad that i went to, to the bathroom before i went to bed <laughs> Probably <laughs> was quite a mess because i was scared I, I was scared for my life they weren't communicating with me so i thought that they i was going to be like one of those exsanguinated cows that they find or something you know you know because yes. i always heard you know i mean you know bud hopkins books and stuff yeah well i was given this yeah. calming uh telepathic message i wasn't you know they they let me experience the fear factor um yeah Later on, not so much, but uh, for that initial contact moment, yes. Uh, and and I, it changed me, though. It changed me for the better. I, and I took it very, very seriously after that, believe me. Yeah. yeah. Lord have I mercy. The, the first <laughs> fear, the first time I felt fear was when the moon and the stars disappeared. That's where it seized mm. me. I literally was hanging out of the car window like a dog and the moon and, and the stars the don't disappear just they did that for you angry. they created the theater it, it, <laughs> and you know it's weird when it gets weird but you you try oh, to yeah you you try to use all the science in you to figure it out and <laughs> good luck thing i had no, that doesn't work <laughs> it just doesn't work yeah, yeah. no no, 
not very scientific, but you know, no. it, I mean, I quote this so often, but Arthur Clark's, you know, old uh, Clark's uh, Clark's law, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And uh, that's very, very, huh. very true. So yeah. true. It seems like magic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it is quite magical after you process it. It is amazing. <laughs> After. Uh, so, sorry Here to cut you are. off. A <laughs> uh, big thank you to Deb, Joe, W. Decker, Chris, Human Carl, and Sasquatch for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate it. Cold Filters over on Twitch. How you doing? And uh, we're caught up here. Here we go, everybody. The next half hour of the show. Enjoy, because we only got them till the top of the hour. Here we go with the second half of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott, your host with the most tinfoil. Proud of it. <laughs> oh, Susan, you make me laugh. You make me laugh. Hey, I want to remind everybody that if you miss portions of this show or others, our archives are always free on any major podcast network or on youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just give us a follow or hit subscribe. That's all we ask. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at spaced out radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. And on Instagram at spaced out radio show. Here we go. Susan Alloway, Earl Gray Anderson. Talking about Susan's amazing case of ET abduction. Susan, I got a couple questions from the audience I want to throw in here before we go. Start off okay. with Ozzy Ange, who's asking, do you find that people have had contact, are drawn to you? Yes, absolutely. And I am drawn to them. I am starting to find them. And the weirdest thing that happened was about uh, maybe eight months ago, I had gone in for a, a minor procedure in the hospital. I was sitting there ready to go in, sitting on a table, and the nurse had looked at, she had her back to me. I literally was thinking, I wonder if my military files are in there. I wonder what all she's looking at. And literally, I heard it in my mind as she turned around and she said, without her mouth, you're very telepathic and everything you're asking about is in here. And then I, I went, oh, and it just scared the crap out of me that I could hear her. I could, it's the first time it's ever, ever happened. It was so thrilling. I reached out and grabbed her hand and I said, quickly, tell me your story. And she looked around the curtain to make sure we had a couple times to talk, minutes to talk. She spoke with her mouth, told me who she was, a little bit of a story. She said, I already know yours. I saw it in my head. Hmm. Um, it, it was that weird. So, you know, yes, those little, all kinds of little things uh, happen. And I, I, I'm so drawn to going back and seeing her. But um, I recently also, uh, well, three years ago, I, I met someone at the Fisherman's Fest and I knew when I saw him, I we were going to be something, and and now we got a really sweet thing, uh, like we're kind of fallen, um, and it's wonderful. So yeah, I do know because um, he's also in this group of uh, paranormal things and contactees, and I do believe that we're drawn to people like that. Uh, I think you know. I think you know when you know, but you don't always say, "Tell me your story." But we probably should do that more often, and then we would find more in common with others. I love that point. Let's go yeah. to Major Lee over the UK. Susan, do you have any hair loss on the areas affected by the radiation burns? Yep, um, I recently have had a really bad thing with my thyroid. I have no hair on my arms. I have really almost no eyebrows. My hair falls out quite often and it always has. Um, but I don't talk to my doctors about radiation burns because it's just not something that I've crossed yet. 
one of these days, I think two worlds will probably collide between the medical and the reality of what happened. But until it does, then uh, I've had a lot of problems with from the radiation. Yeah. Paramar was asking, you mentioned being a lifelong contactee. Did this factor into you joining the Navy? Did you think you might be protected there? Did you have any experiences while enlisted? Um, I, I saw orbs. I was in a C-130 squadron. I worked on the flight line and occasionally I'd want to go fly, you know, because sometimes you want to see what your squadron does and you get on the planes. And I had seen orbs off the wings, uh, two orange ones, and then one time at a separate trip, uh, a gray, which looked metallic, but it wasn't shining, so I'm not quite sure why I thought it was metallic. But when I spoke and I said, you know, what is that? I got the finger in the face that said, we don't talk about it. Don't ask me about it. And then after a few other mentionings, if you continue to talk about it, we'll transfer you. That was, I was the first woman on the flight line. That was always the threat. If you continue to speak about things you're not supposed to, you will be transferred. So I just clammed up about it and just watched because um, I knew it was something to do with all the other oddness in my life. But there were a few other people in my squadron that worked on the line. The second woman that checked in and she was very clairvoyant. We could practically have a conversation without speaking and she knew what was going on also. And they did transfer her out. Mm because she said a little bit too much about it. So, Right. All right. Another question from Nikki in Seattle. What shape was the craft? I don't know the shape. I just know the circle seemed round when the light came down. It was so big it took the car, the side of the road, all the jackrabbits, which was about 30, so that's huge. And it was so giant, you couldn't see any moon or star, so it had to be mountain to mountain. That's the, all I can say. Mm -hmm. It was tremendous. And um, one of the things that the investigator Richard found was other reports, and Preston also found them, other reports to move on on that same night within 50 miles within just a few moments uh, that people had pulled over on the side of the road and reported tremendous ship. One of them was pacing his car and his daughter who was in the uh, passenger side got scared to death and he pulled over. And it even mentioned in the report uh, that a lot of people pulled over and saw it, but um, I, I, there was no shape. It's just tremendous is what it was. So, um, Earl, I want to ask you just quickly about <laughs> a little bit off topic about craft, because a lot of times People don't know the size of the craft or they all they see or report on is a small orb. But the minute they're on the craft, this small orb seems to go on for dozens, if not hundreds of feet inside. Yeah. It's called a TARDIS in, in Doctor Who uh, language. And, <laughs> and it, I believe that that's true. I think that our visitors are masters of time, space and matter. So something can seem very, very small on the outside, and then you're inside of it, and it's like the size of a cathedral. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they, it's, it's inexplicable using scientific terms that we understand, but uh, that just seems to be the way that this works. It, it's like magic. You know, we were talking about that while on break. You know, Arthur Clarke's <laughs> law, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's the way that this phenomenon works. Seems like magic to us. I think it's just very, very advanced. We will learn how to do that someday. But right now, I don't think so. <laughs> that's sufficient. I like it. I love it. All right. Going back to what you were talking about right before the break. Susan, what happened in 1989? So I had my two children, raised my kids. We moved a whole lot of times. I got really sick in Ventura in 1989, had to have a hysterectomy. And it was quick from the time I went to the doctor until the time I had it. 
Um, the next morning when I woke up, it was only about 12 hours after I'd had it. Um, I was on pain medicine and the doctor came in and he said, you, you told us that you had never had surgery. And I said, no, I, I have it. And he said, well, this was the weirdest thing. I've never seen anything like this before. And I've done surgery. He's 89 now. So he had done surgery for a long time already. And he said, you have, um, first of all, a missing ovary. Your right ovary was missing, just not there. And I looked at him like, what are you talking about? You know, but I just had every, it, it was like red flag, red flag. It has something to do with that night in 1978. Mm. And then he said, and your appendix at some time had apparently burst and it had all been tucked in nice and neat. This is so creepy and folded over and you had an incision that was nice and neat and it included the fallopian tube in the incision nice and neat and it had been closed the incision had been closed with a high cauterization heat hmm. laser and he said i took that out and inside your appendix was a weird sack of pellets it, what do you think about that can you explain that because you have no other scars how did a surgery happen that you've had no scars or, or in no memory of and I just blew it off as who I don't know these pain drugs are really good and I can't really think about it right now because I was scared at that point it was a fine line that I would have crossed if I would have said oh that must have I'm glad I didn't say that's when I got beamed up and they did some surgery because that's what I think happened Dave and it's so weird because just that, now that was 1989. I've called that doctor. There's no records that far back. I've even spoken to the nurse and the doctor and he can't remember because he has beginning of dementia. And I called the hospital, no record because it's too far back. But then I got to thinking, I've got my military record. So I reached down here and I remember Deb Cobbles was saying something on a show and it popped into my head to grab my record. And I started looking back and three months before I got out of the service, September 14th, 1978, three months, that whole last three months, I had been having trouble with my right lower quadrant. They couldn't decide if it was my appendix or an, here we go, a cyst on my right ovary. And I had had three examinations. There was wow. definitely a right ovary there three months prior to my getting out. So that's the only time it could have disappeared. It's the only explanation. It didn't just pop out and I had surgery on my appendix and then it was found in 89 and taken out. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. And here's the here's the other cool thing that it just because the record thing just happened recently. It was like, oh, my God, I got some proof that I did have that right ovary and that something was wrong with that appendix. That's why I really think they probably saved my life. And I don't know why. Yeah. And I don't feel awful that they took my ovary because I'm alive to tell it. And um, I still had my children all those years not even knowing I didn't have the ovary and um, just three weeks ago maybe about a month ago I was watching the brand new ancient aliens and Debbie Ziegelmeyer was on there with her theory about the 37th parallel and I was watching it just out of the blue and it hit me when I saw it go across when she actually put the figure of the United States up there and where it went and I grabbed my phone and I said Siri is Cedar City what what parallel is Cedar City Utah on and I'd be damned if, if Siri didn't say the 37th parallel this case just keeps <laughs> on giving it happened on the 37th parallel where there are hundreds and hundreds of cases
of the cattle mutilations, what? sightings, all kinds of stuff. It blew my mind because after all these years, these little things are coming to light. And I wrote Earl and I said, you won't believe this. <laughs> I remember <laughs> writing true. Earl yeah, and Jackson sure and Debs and I said, you won't even believe this, but this is the fact that I just found out. And when Siri said literally the 37th parallel, not not 36.8 or not 39, but the 37th, exactly as the theory. I was just shocked. And when I looked at North Carolina, where I had wow. the beginning, it was 36.8. So that's really close. <laughs> and I was floored by that, that after all these years, that fact came to me. I was so thrilled that that happened. <laughs> Um, I would be too. You know that I mean, Debbie Ziegelmeyer's sister is my is my assistant state director here. Is Linda Fletchner, her, oh. her brother uh, Chuck Zukowski and Debbie Ziegelmeyer. They yeah. were you know working up in, in on the thirty seventh parallel, while her sister was here in, in Southern California working with Mufon for in the in the same group that I was. So it's all connected. It, it just it's like the peeling the onion. It just keeps going yeah. deeper, huh? The rabbit and hole. Gonna, there you go. <laughs> meet her at the symposium in Dallas, and I'll get to tell Debbie face to face about this because yep. she's doing She'll research and I added to that research. I thought that was so cool. The thirty-seventh hmm. parallel. What's the chance, you know? And to find that in my record. What's the chance after it's been forty-six years now, Dave? Wow. And little things are still coming in. I was four. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but that's how synchronicity works, you know. It just has yeah. layers to it. Synchronicity, and that's I, you yeah. know, what I hear. Uh, I was told years ago that uh, you know those those uh, meaningful coincidences uh, that happen. That then that's what a, a synchronicity is. It's a meaningful coincidence. But when you're experiencing those, you're on the right path. And it's one of the ways that ET connect, you know, connects with us and communicates with us. And, yeah. uh, your case has so many synchronicities to it, including rabbits. And you're, you know, going down the <laughs> rabbit hole. Well, you yeah. literally did. You went up <laughs> the rabbit hole, I guess, but, incredible. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's and it's so my entire life has been this way. My kids and my family used to call it mom's world. They would do the, you know, oh, it's <laughs> mom's world, Susan's world. They don't understand that it's such a part of my life. And hmm. they don't like to speak about it. And I think it kind of embarrasses them to speak about it sometimes. But at other times they used it to thrill somebody. You know, when they yeah. want to. So, um, <laughs> yeah, by the way, my mom's got nice. aliens, you know. Yeah, yeah, mom's got aliens, right. Yeah. My son loves uh, UFOs, like on uh, the Reddit UFO pages. And he's always, uh, you know, I'll get the call. Oh, uh, there's, there's Paul, you know. And dad, yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, so it's all good, you know. Right. It brings us together. And sometimes people would come to visit and they they would mention uh, or they would see a book because after a while I quit putting Whitley's book with the weird, you know, communion face. I quit putting it in my underwear drawer or in my clothes drawer because the kids would find Very common. it, lay it on the coffee table. And and when people would come to visit, if I would have extra books just so that I could pass them along to get the word out because I I, I was not ready to tell. But mm -hmm. I had to do something because I knew how real, real it was. And um, all I really had to hang on was Debbie uh, Cobble's story. And she, mm -hmm. her name was Kathy Davis to me. And those were my heroes mm -hmm. is being able to read their stories and know that it had happened to someone else that was pretty much my age. And that nice they had to come forward to say it. So... It's nice when that happens, that you can find that connection. See, I, I know for me, one of the biggest reasons why I started this show way back when, Susan, was because 
I couldn't find anybody who had the same thing happen to me. Yeah. Right. I couldn't, I, I just, it was, it was the weirdest thing. I'd always find similarities, but never yeah. exactly the same thing. Like everybody yeah. sees the black triangles with three dots. My black triangle, the first one I see has an entire undercarriage lit up. Well, try searching that out. It doesn't happen. Right. It does. I mean, I've got uh, cases. I have a case like that, Dave. <laughs> a bunch of little back, lights on the bottom. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But back then I didn't even know what MUFON was, Mer uh, Earl. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know. <laughs> Just like way before I even started the radio show. Hmm. And it's yeah. funny, I hear people talk about MUFON in a negative sometimes. Like I reported, they never contacted me. Well, all I have to say is my case, I reported it. It, it got sent on in a, a course and it's been about three days. I heard from Richard and it just got better and better and better. I couldn't imagine. Sometimes stuff goes to the spam <laughs> file. I'll call people and I'll, I'll send people an email and say, you know, I got your case and I'd love to talk with you. And, um, and I'll send another email like, you know, a few weeks later and say, this is a second email, but I'm going to, and they'll get the second one and I'll say, and they'll say, well, I never got an email from you. And it's like, well, check your spam folder. And it's, it's always unequivocally, it's the spam. So that's what yeah. happens. But it, you know, yeah. people think that we just ignored their case, but we don't. And I think sometimes you just have to, you have to keep that light burning yourself and, offer the extra the absolute it only happened one way and you deliver it that exact way there should be no change because it's it's simply these are the facts and i just stuck with that and it was amazing how richard with his questions that first five hours really pulled it out of me of things that i hadn't even thought about but they were so clear um it really made me feel um, more sane again. <laughs> and then after the hypnosis, you know, that all made just such a big difference. It, I think, it, Dave, I think everybody should have hypnosis at least once in their life because all of that stuff that happens. It's that connection. You can leave it. It's a catharsis for people. And process and go forward. It's just, it's been wonderful. And it helped, it's helped me so much to be able to deliver this and speak about it considering for years i couldn't even speak at all about it i couldn't even think about it sometimes so we have <laughs> 90 seconds to go before we have to say good night here to both of you guys and it's been a show that's flown on by i i'm curious susan where does the story go from here um well it's going to the symposium in july <laughs> with earl <laughs> Um, I don't know. You know, I'm just. And Richard I, will be there too. There's, you know, yeah. the whole hail, hail, I'm the hoping, game's going to be all. I'm hoping Karen shows up. I'm hoping, all there. I'm hoping or, Karen you know, shows up. So. But um, I, I'm not sure where Go it up. goes. <laughs> oh, I hope so too. I, I'm just open to however, Dave, and i um, excited for people to actually finally hear it and be able to tell it. And. Um, I, I really have no agenda whatsoever. I'm just living my life. I'm an artist. I, I, I'll show you what I make. This is one of the things I make. This is, this is a fairy house. And I sell these at shows so you can, so oh, I've so always cool. got stuff going Very on. Cute. You can even mm -hmm. see in the top of Very it. Cute. So um, I do those and I do shows and I'm just kind of a quiet life and I like it that way. Um, if Nothing anybody else. wants the fairy house or to talk, you can find me on Facebook. And I don't have any other pages or a website or anything because I like my peace. I like being retired. I enjoy having time to waste or think or just enjoy myself. All anyway, right. <laughs> Susan Alloway, Earl Gray Anderson, thank you for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight and telling your story. Amazing, amazing. First-hand encounter of extraterrestrials. That's what I love about, about doing this show. Coming up next, Steve Stockton from Among the Missing. Then, right after that, 
we have Robin Haynes with the Cryptid Report. It's day 101 night. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. All right, guys. Thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. It was awesome. Thank you yeah. for inviting me. Now Thanks I can go. And, um, yeah. It's time for Thank my you. good night beer. <laughs> All right. I like that. I don't do like that on that. camera, but I'm going to go have my go to sleep beer, Earl. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, Thank Earl, you, you enjoy. guys. Enjoy it. And Susan, I, thank you so much. I want to come back. I got a whole Night, lot more guys. weird going on, Dave, that you don't even know about. I'm yet. proud of you, oh. Susan. <laughs> I'm I'm I'm, I'm proud of this woman here. She's she's a, a wonderful advocate for experiencers worldwide, and your people are going to be hearing your story, dear. You know that's getting buckle Perfect. up, Buttercup. You know. Yep. <laughs> All right, guys. Gonna yep. let you go. Have a great Thanks night. So Thank much. you, Dave. Have Take a sweet care, night. You too, Earl. Bye now. Bye. Love them. Love them. All right. I'm going to take a quick break here. And we'll be right back.
All right. Here we go. Got one minute. Hi, Susan Alloway. Welcome to SOR Chat tonight. Robin Haynes is looking great. Week tonight, I'll be meeting her. If she stays awake that late. Thank you, Tim Mothman and his goatee, Sasquatch guy, human Carl, Chris, W. Decker, Joe, and Deb for the super chats. Very much appreciate your love and support of SOR. Thank you to all our new subscribers and followers on Twitter or X. And here we go, everybody. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nipitatum. Nipitatum is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night to say hello to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing and another spooky story. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. On a hot summer morning in August of 1892, one of the most infamous mysteries of murder cases in American history occurred in Fall River, Massachusetts, when 70-year-old Andrew Borden and his wife, Abby, were murdered by an ax in their home. Andrew's then 32-year-old daughter, Lizzie, reportedly found her father's body after returning home from morning errands. The family's maid, Bridget Sullivan, discovered Abby's body in the second floor guest room. Though generally viewed as a reputable community member, Lizzie was deemed a suspect in the double homicide and her trial began on June 5, 1893. Prosecutors alleged she tried to purchase poison the day before the murders and burned one of her dresses several days later. Fingerprint testing was common in Europe at the time, but the Fall River police were skeptical of its accuracy and never tested for prints on a hatchet found in the Borden's basement. The fact that no blood was found on Lizzie helped convince the all-male jury that she was incapable of the gruesome crime, and she was acquitted on June 20, 1893. Some have speculated that the killer was Andrew Borden's illegitimate son, William Borden, who snapped after Andrew failed to submit to his extortion demands regarding finances. However, no other suspects were ever charged of the murders, and Lizzie succumbed to pneumonia in Fall River on June 1, 1927. The Borden family home has since been transformed into the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum, which continues to attract visitors to this day. Located at 232nd Street, visitors at the Bed and Breakfast report doors opening and closing on their own, along with a mysterious floral scent that some attribute to the Borden's restless spirits. Next, we have the kidnapping and murder of Holly Perrainen. On August 5, 1993, 10-year-old Holly Perrainen returned to her grandparents' rural summer cottage on South Pond in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, where she was vacationing with her family. Holly spent the morning swimming with her father and two brothers. After returning to the cottage, Holly and her five-year-old brother, Zach, walked a few hundred yards to the fence at the back of a neighbor's yard 
to visit a litter of collie puppies. Zack returned without Holly a short time later. The family looked for Holly, but only one of her sneakers was found near the roadway. A massive search was launched, but sadly, 73 days later, on October 23, 1993, Holly's remains were found in a wooded area near Five Bridge Road in Brimfield, Massachusetts. Now, while there's no shortage of persons of interest, Holly's killer has never been found. In 2023, the district attorney's office announced a slight breakthrough after a tank top was located at the crime scene and the public was asked to help identify where the shirt came from or who it belonged to. Anyone with any information on the disappearance and murder of Holly is asked to call the Massachusetts State Police Detective Unit at 413-505-5993 or text a tip to CRIMES, that's 274-637, and type SOLVE HOLLY PERANIN and your tip in the message. Now we have the kidnapping and murder of Molly Bish. On June 27, 2000, 16-year-old Molly Bish of Warren, Massachusetts, vanished just a day after she started working as a lifeguard at a pond in her hometown. The search to find her became the most extensive search for a missing person in Massachusetts history. Molly's story would later become the focus of a 2002 feature by Mel Allen, an editor for Yankee Magazine. At the time of the article, Molly's parents still had hopes that their daughter was alive. Sadly, Molly's remains were recovered just five miles from her home the following year. The party or parties responsible have never been found, making Molly's case one of New England's most frustrating unsolved mysteries. Massachusetts State Police encourage anyone with information on Molly's case to call their anonymous tip line at 508-453-7575. And thank you to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for another creepy story. If you like stories like that, head on over to his YouTube channel, Among the Missing. Hit subscribe and ring that bell today. From the Missing to the Mysterious, it's time for Robin Haynes and the Cryptid Report. <laughs> Robin Haynes returns, and in one week from tonight, I will be hanging out with Robin in somewhere in the middle of Nebraska for the <laughs> Nebraska Foot Conference, and I am so excited about this, Robin. Very excited. I am, too. We are going to have so much fun. I cannot wait to give you a giant hug, and it's going to be a blast. And I'm staying at the hotel this time. Normally, I stay with Harriet McFeely, who owns the conference. And this time I'm actually staying at the hotel with all the speakers so I can hang out with everybody, make sure everybody gets what they need and get the shuttles that need to go back and forth to the hall. And so I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have a blast. We're going to have an absolute blast. Oh, I think we're going to have a blast as well. And, you know, what is the importance of conferences like this one for people who want to get educated? Just the education. I mean, you know, there's right ways and wrong ways to go about this. Well, everybody can do it their own way. It's all about the respect that you have with these Sasquatch and it's learning information from each other. Like it doesn't matter how much information you have, you're never gonna have enough. And it's gonna take all of us together as a collective to learn anything about these. And it's about sharing the information making people aware that there are good ones, there are bad ones, you know, they're primarily good, but we know there's bad ones as well. Getting that information out there. These are a type of people an ancient people. They are not monsters. They are not Nephilim. They have their own culture, their own laws, their own way of life, their own alphabet. They can read, they can write. I mean, all of this combined. And it's a great way to be able to get that information out and then share as a community each other's stories so that you can learn from each other. You know, you almost end up getting a sense of fellowship with everybody that's there. We get a lot of people that come every year for this. You know, I've got like my regular people that come from out of state to see me that I cherish and can spend time with. And you just have that camaraderie, you know, and you learn from each other. Even for the speakers, we learn from the people that come. You know, they may learn and take away things that we talk to them about, but we also learn from them. We want to hear their stories. We want to talk to them. We want to, you know, share information. 
And it's a great way to do that. Plus we get awesome vendors. So you get some really cool swag. But the main thing is coming together as a community, learning. That's what it's all about is learning and sharing experiences with each other. Who are the speakers that will be there this year? We have Jim Myers, who's out of Colorado. We have Steve Burke that is a native to um, Nebraska and does a lot of research as far as different paranormal things. We have Ron and Alan that do our videos, um, Alan McGargle, Ron Meyer, and they have films um, that are usually cryptid related. They are going to be there. We have yourself. We have Duke Sullivan. We have Blaine Tyler. We have Christian McLeod, myself. And I'm trying to think of, odd. we have so many people this year. Um, I'm trying to think of who else we've got there. Um, we've got three different movies that are going to be there. Normally, we only have one. We've got three this year. We have um, one by Ron and Alan, which they have some great movies they bring every year. We've got Flash of Beauty, The Paranormal. Oh, that, yeah, and Jill Rymaker, which is the producer for Flash of Beauty, she will be speaking, which we're really thrilled to have her with us. And then Duke Sullivan has Inevitably Finding Bigfoot, and he'll be showing that and releasing that on Saturday. So we've just been really blessed. We've got some really great people this year. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting. I think it's going to be an absolute blast. You have a good mix of people as well who who yeah. are different genres within the community from very serious researchers to very open-minded mm -hmm. people. You know, how hard is it to find that balance that's going to fit kind of the perspective of the conference? Um, I think we've been really blessed every year. You know, we get a good variety when we go through. Now, when we do a conference, by the time the conference is over Saturday night, by Monday, Harriet and I have sat down and we've, we've kicked back and forth ideas on who we want. And we've already started the booking for the, the next year. I mean, we start at that early. We don't get any downtime. And we really try to balance it out. We really do. We want to have people that might have a little bit of a paranormal flair, people that have, you know, the flesh and blood. Um, we try to get some movies that we think are going to be really beneficial and that people are going to enjoy. We want to get people like yourself that have this, you know, abundance of information all the way around in, you know, whether it's the ET thing or, or the cryptid thing or what your journey is, whether it's new people that are starting on the scene or people that have been doing it for years. And we just try to really hard to balance it out. But it's not really all that hard. Like we've been really blessed because there's so many great people in this industry. It's just about getting hold of them and contacting them. I love it. I love it. And is this an event that actually has a lot of people attending? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Last year, we had over 500 people through the course of Friday and Saturday. We actually, the venue that we have this year, we partnered with the tourism board in Grand Island, which is a much bigger city than Hastings, which is where we normally have it. And we originally got a building that would be set up for 500 people. And we became quickly aware that that was not going to hold us. So we've got about 14, 15 vendors that have got some great stuff this year. And um, our speakers will be bringing things as well. And we actually had to bump up our room size to 750. So, you know, and then you've got your vendors in there with you as well. So I think it's going to be a lot bigger than what we thought. I know our ticket sales were up 65% last I checked. Um, the people are tremendous. You know, there'll be food services that are there. We will have Friday night, we've got Ron and Alan's movie. And then we've also got Flash of Beauty Paranormal. And then, like I said, Saturday night at the end of the conference, we have Duke's Inevitably Finding Bigfoot. So that will be there. So we've really got some great things. We've got door prizes. Um, we make sure that our speakers are available to speak to people off stage. So if you want to, you know, talk to anybody, get some extra info or whatever, it turns into like this great big family event. Like when I started doing this with Harriet McFeely for you, and we have a great team. There's myself, there's Harriet, we have Tamara, we have Diane, um, now the tourism board, and we just work as a family. We really do. And we try to make it feel like that when you come to the conferences, it's very laid back, very family oriented, and it's just like old home week. You know, we just have such a good time 
And, you know, this is Harriet McFeely's deal, and she does a great job at it. I got brought in on it about four years ago. She has the Bigfoot Crossroads of America Museum in Nebraska, which is also um, in the, um, now I can't even think of it, in Washington. And my mind's drawing a blank because I'm so tired. But um, <laughs> Library of Congress, thank you. And right. so it's in the Library of Congress. And so she has the museum there. So she's busy working on a museum and she updates that museum every year. So that's, you know, something that's pretty incredible in itself. You got to tip me off to one thing, Robin. What? What time will I be speaking and what day? You, I believe I have you on. Um, I'd have to look at my book. I think you're Saturday morning. I've, I've either got you, I think you're Saturday morning because I've got Steve Burke, Jim Myers, and I've either got you midday Friday before they start talking about the movies, but I don't think so. I think I've got you Saturday morning. Oh, and then Christian, it'll be you, Christian McLeod, myself, and then it'll break for lunch. And then Blaine Tyler will be there and his beautiful wife, Lisa. And then after that will be Duke in his movie. So I think you're on Saturday. I'll double check it because I'm the one that did the schedule, but I've had to redo it to accommodate everybody about four times. So I think I've got you done for Saturday morning. You, you have tried. to let me know because that'll be like seven o'clock my time in the morning. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, hopefully you're going to come in on Thursday. So that'll give you a little bit of time to adjust a little bit. And I've got it set up with the hotel. So if you need to sleep in on Friday morning, you know, you have that ability to, because the shuttles are going to run from that to the event hall all day. Cool. And the ho yeah, the hotels is really trying hard to work with us. This is the first year that they've hosted us and they kind of want to keep us coming back. Um, Good. The we've had a lot of advertisement for it, which we normally do anyway, but the tourism board has pushed it even further this year. So I'm anxious to see, kind of where we're at. And we're at the biggest event center in all of Nebraska. This is Fonner Park. So not only are we there, but they have other events going in this huge multi-complex as well. So we're going to get the extra crowd from the other events that are going on as well. So I'm really excited about it. It should be a lot of fun. We normally really have a good time. Like I said, we're pretty laid back. And as long as everybody's behaving themselves, we just kind of go with the flow. But I think it's going to be really exciting this year. One thing that I love hearing is people's stories about their encounters. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure by that lineup, we're going to have a lot of really cool encounters there. Yeah. And we, we really encourage our audience to participate. We want those questions when we have our, our speakers on stage. If you can't get time to talk to these speakers that are on stage, please come to their table, find them, talk to them, share your experiences. We want those. We want to get people talking. We want that interaction. We don't expect anybody to just blindly sit there, listen to what we have to talk about and say nothing. We want the questions. We want the contact. We want to share information. And we want everybody's information as well. Um, we also have, um, we get donations and Speedy Chevrolet out of Hastings, Jerry Spady. Um, has been tremendous in helping us with flyers, donating Diane because she works there, her time to help us out with it. And we thank them profusely. And so it's really a team effort. You know, we work on this all year long and this is our first year that we've paired with the tourism board. And so far, I think it's it's been a great pairing. I think we're really going to benefit each other. It's just more fun, you know, and that's, that at the end of the day is the name of the game. We want people to enjoy. We want them to walk away knowing that they've learned something or maybe, you know, they've had an experience and they felt there was nowhere to share it. We want them to know that it's a safe zone. Share your experience. Talk to us, you know, talk to our speakers. That's what they're there for. You know, communication, getting it all out. We want to hear your stuff. You want to hear our stuff. Let's combine it. I love it. I love it. And, you know, the fact that so many different people are coming with movies and documentaries, this just makes it a little bit more exciting when, when it used to be with research, 
literally you're going out in the field and you might get a couple of photos and you know there's the standardized photo of somebody holding up a, a sasquatch footprint cast it's so beyond that now it is and we've got i think a large portion of our speakers are bringing photos i know i've got a very dear friend of mine is putting together a powerpoint for me because i've showed my photos before and i've gotten you know a lot of good response from it but they you know on the big screen it dissipates it and so he's kind of worked and tried to get those a little bit more suited for the bigger screen so i'll have mine but um, most of our speakers are bringing photos if not they're bringing just a huge amount of information and that will be be very helpful i've got so, my powerpoint ready I'm i can't ready. wait and we've we've got some really great people as far as for the electronics and our speaker system um so i think we're going to do really well we really haven't had too many problems with that so i think you know that'll be nice as well um the movies are going to be played right directly in the conference hall where for a while we had to take them you know outside of that in the setup that we have now is they'll be played right there nobody has to go anywhere we'll take a nice dinner break and then we'll get on to the movies what i really like about it is like uh ron meyer alan mcgargle that do their movie they're on site they're going to speak and then they're there to answer questions for their movie we've got brett and jill from flash of beauty paranormal which i'm obsessed with their movies and they're there to speak so that's going to be tremendous Duke Sullivan's going to be there. He can talk about inevitably finding Bigfoot and his experiences. So you don't just get the movies. You get to talk to the people that made the movies. You know, if you have questions, they're on site. And I think that's huge because we all have questions about what we see and, you know, things that we're thinking about it. So they're right there on site. Jim Myers is tremendous. He's out of Colorado. He's got some great experiences. He owns um, a store. Sasquatch Outpost, phenomenal swag there. Oh my God, I love this stuff. And so he's going to be there. So we're very, very excited about that. Of course, Steve Burke, you know, he's a resident of Nebraska and he's got all kinds of paranormal things he can talk to us about. Blaine Tyler, I mean, what can you not say about Blaine? Blaine's tremendous. And he's going to be there with his wife, Lisa. I think they're going to talk about some casting. Uh, cryptic guy, Christian McLeod, amazing experiences up the wazoo wonderful person great amount of knowledge so he's going to be there i'm going to be speaking again this year we try not to have people there more than twice in a row the only reason i'm speaking again is because at the end of it we put out a questionnaire on how to rate our speakers and everybody keeps asking me back so i'm gonna do it again this year i don't know if i'll continue speaking every, i'll be there every year because i help run it but um, whether or not I'll speak after this year, I don't know. This is the fourth year and we don't usually do that. So, and then, like I said, Duke's got his movie and he'll be there to answer questions. So, you know, and he's phenomenal. So we've really been blessed. We've, we've had some amazing awesome. speakers every year. One minute to go. Could you let everybody know where they can find tickets if all of a sudden they're booking a last minute trip? Sure. Go on the Nebraska Bigfoot conference, 2024, and they can go on there to, buy pre-tickets we also sell pick tickets at the door but you can get package deals as far as you know for the movies and um your tickets or like i said you, you're more than welcome to buy them at the door that's not a problem but if you want to get them ahead of time that's the place to go and it'll give you a rundown on our speakers and if i miss any of our speakers i apologize profusely but um it'll give you the rundown of the speakers what their credentials are and a little bit of information there so we hope to see everybody. And of course, we're going to have Dave there. So that's a plus. I'm so excited for you to be there. Like, I can't wait to actually see you. I know. It's going to be amazing. Good. It is. It's going to be Please. fantastic. Robin, yep. And we're going to see if I can even get out of there. Every year we do this, I can't get out. So they keep me there. Robin Haynes in the Cryptid Report, Nebraska. Bigfoot Conference this next week. is Spaced Out Radio. And your host. Dave Scott. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, buddy. No problem. Yeah, if you need anything, just let me know. 
Um, and you should be fine. I've got all your ticket information as well. So I'll make sure the shuttle's there to pick you up. If not, I'll make sure I'm there. And I'll probably touch base with you beforehand. Who's picking me up at the airport? Well, it should be the shuttle from the hotel. Um, okay. We have the best Western Inn and Suites. And they have very graciously offered to run shuttle to it, the Grand Island Airport to bring you to the hotel. And then they'll take everybody from the hotel to the conference hall. And they'll keep that shuttle going on and off through the day. Because I land at like 11, 18 p.m. Yeah. And you know what? I tried to get you a flight that would get you there earlier. And they've combined so many flights. It was the only one I could get. I, so, I don't mind the flight. I just want to make sure that somebody's going to be picking me up. There. No. And no, that's why I'm staying at the hotel. See, I stay at Harriet's house every year. I have my own room at her house. And I love it. But with this new venue and a different hotel and everything, I wanted to make sure I was on site in case anybody needed anything. So I'll be monitoring the shuttles. So if by any chance the shuttles, there's a problem, I will come get you. Okay. Perfect. Is the bar open? They're supposed to have a bar. I don't know if they have a bar in the hotel, but where we're at, we're within walking distance to restaurants, bars, whatever. We're going to the bar. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Friday night, we're going to the bar. Oh, well, I will see you soon, my friend. I cannot wait. All right. See you later. All right. Love you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. Robin Haynes, everybody. Charlie, don't surf. How you doing? All right. Corn stocking. What is corn stocking? I don't even think the corn will be up by then. <sighs> Excuse me, guys. Hmm. I'll totally meet the children of the corn. That'd be fun. You can't kill me. I like the woo. Yeah. Right? LOL at Puck Elf. That's awesome. Good night, Vanessa. All right. We got like a couple of minutes here. I just got to do some thinking here. No, we're not ending early, Tim. I just got to do some thinking here. I got to put together my Dave 101. Can't you see my brain working? No, 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 no. Hmm. You're welcome, Susan, out of the way. Thank you to Tim Mothman and his goatee, Deb, Er, Uni, Joe, W. Decker, Chris, Human Carl, and Sasquatch Guy for the amazing super chats. Thank you to everybody who has hit subscribe and ring that bell tonight. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, oh, I'm scheduled for 1 o'clock on Friday. Perfect. That way I can sleep in. It's still party. Hard. Yeah. Thank you. Don't want to be speaking at early. 
Don't like the early shift. Tets, how you doing? Boo, the beagle, Robert Anthony. How are you guys doing? Hey, there's sweet Robbie G, everybody. Give him a wave. He always waves back. Here we go at the third and final half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate you tuning us in wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to remind all of you that if you miss most of this show or others, all of our archives, guess what? They're always free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. We're on every major podcast network as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon and the Space Travelers Club. And check out our website, spacedoutradio.com. It is that time of the night where we say, get off my lawn. It's the Dave 101. It's time for Dave 101. In a week from now, I'm going to be visiting the lovely state of Nebraska, where is a Canadian on the West Coast? To be honest with you, I don't I don't even know where it is. Don't even know. But the adventuresome side of me says We're going to tackle some corn, some corn huskers, and maybe try and find some Bigfoot. And, you know, when you go into these conferences as a speaker, you're always like, what am I going to do? What am I going to say that's going to change the understanding of what is going on? Why? Because I'll let you in on a little secret. If you've never been to a UFO conference, a Sasquatch conference, a paranormal conference, nine times out of 10, there's always somebody who is saying the exact same thing and they're presenting it very monotonely. So for me, I actually try and spice things up a little bit. You know, I like to be able to to make myself stand out a little bit. And no, it's not just by my weight gain or the nice blazer that I will wear, right? No, I try and put it together. So this is what I'm going to be doing because I know the majority of you out there are not going to be in Nebraska for this event. So I am breaking it down with my own personal experiences with Sasquatch. Yeah, it's going to be great. But then I'm going to sneak something in because I think you always need to Sneak something in. And I'm going to sneak in the woo side of everything. See, I think a lot of people in the Bigfoot world really try hard, very hard, to be so scientific, right? Why? Because they feel it makes them look good. They feel it makes them look more credible. I don't care about that. What I care about is telling a good story, a truthful story, but a good story nonetheless. And whether it's UFOs, Bigfoot, paranormal, really doesn't matter. Your topic du jour. Guys, there's some great stories out there that we are missing. Listen to Susan Alloway. If you haven't tonight and you showed up late, listen to Susan Alloway on our archive a personal experience about alien encounters with Sasquatch. There are people who have some amazing encounters. I know the one that I had back in 2022 where literally, literally four of us don't know how that Sasquatch left us. They don't, I don't only the Sasquatch knows. 
We were watching it. It was right there, about 100 yards in front of us. How did it leave? No idea. That's the type of story that intrigues me. Because there is so much mystery regarding these subjects. We should be excited that there are illogical answers for logical questions. That's what makes this fun. That's what makes this entire field so much better because look, we're not putting a golf ball into a little hole 500 yards away after a drive, a second shot, and probably a chip onto the green to make you lie for birdie on four. All right. If you're like me, you four putt and then you quit golf forever. But I love hearing people's stories, and I encourage people to find the strength to come out and tell their stories. Why? Because this is how we're all going to learn. This is how we're all going to understand that it's okay to talk about the high strangeness that we experience. I want to be able to share my stories with you without having anybody, you know, look at me and say, oh, that didn't happen. And trust me, I've heard it all. That didn't happen. You're lying. You're doing it for clickbait. You're doing it for more followers and subscribers. You're part of the grifters club. Just trying to make a buck off these stupid stories. No, what I'm trying to do is encourage people to speak about their own. Whether it's a one and done, you walked into a work one day and you saw a shadow person running through the wall, or whether you and your friends are out hiking and you come across a valley, you look into that valley and there's a couple Sasquatch wrestling around, or you're out at night and you see some weird lights in the sky that fly so close to your vehicle that you think you're going to collide with it. And then it takes off with no sound and goes straight into the stars and disappears. Those are the stories that I want to hear. And we all have them. And there's too many in these communities right now that do not like the story. They don't think it's evidence. And respectfully so, it might not be. Eyewitness testimony is not the most accurate. But... I want to know those experiences. I want to know how people feel about it happening. Even though eyewitness testimony may not be the best, learning about what a person goes through, whether it's the emotions, the anger, the fear, the happiness, and everything in between is how we learn. It may not be the scientific way, but it's an important way on how we learn about these subjects. And if we continue to try and shut out the storytelling, the woo tellers, the people who have extraordinary experiences that really should not exist, we're really hurting ourselves because we are taking information and blowing it up when it could lead to something extremely more important. I don't know about you guys, but I really like the fact that I can sit here and listen to a number of you come on this show or even messaging me privately, okay, letting me know about what you encountered. That to me is so much more important. Why? Because it takes us a little bit of bravery in order to actually say, I want to talk about what happens. I want to talk about what happened to me. I want to talk about how I felt. I want to talk about everything to do with my story. Okay? That's the only thing we can do fair. And we have to take those people and comfort them and nurture them to make sure that they know that they are in a safe space for sharing some of their most intimate details 
and I'm not talking sexually intimate here. I'm talking personally intimate that they might not even share with their own mom and dad or brothers and sisters. Look, there's a lot of high strangeness out there, and we want to make sure that it continues to come out. We do that with open communication. And that's the way we have to do it. That's the way we need to be able to to continue to, to grow and expand our knowledge, right? We're built a little bit differently as experiencers, as people who have, have experienced the unknown. We're looking at each other saying, I'm here to support you if you're going to support me on this. We all need support. We all need that, that feeling of vindication that we're not alone with what is happening. Yes, there are entire genres out there that try and shoot down the people, but you know what? Here's the thing. Do you remember as a kid when you sat around a campfire? Maybe it was with your parents out on a fishing or hunting trip or just camping in the wilderness. You know, remember the days where we could actually have campfires? There wasn't the threat of super forest fires everywhere. Yeah, I remember those too. But remember sitting around those campfires. Maybe you're roasting some marshmallows or a hot dog. It's dark out. You can hear all the night creatures coming alive from the owls to to the bugs that are flying by, the mosquitoes that you're slapping on your arm, the Sasquatch in the forest. No, I'm teasing on that. But we would all sit around, and eventually those stories would get to spooky stories. A haunting, you know, most of the time it was a friend of a friend of a friend who brought us down that road and told their spooky story of a of a Ouija board session gone bad. It was always those stories that we sat around and we looked forward to them. In today's 2024, with the work of the internet, shows like ours and other podcasts and YouTube channels that are promoting this type of subject, we have more stories than ever. And I do understand that it is a fringe minority out there that doesn't like these stories. They might be a part of the government. They might be part of the skeptical crew. They might be part of the trust me, bro, I've had enough crew. They might be the type of people who just don't believe. Right? What we need to do is we need to tune those stories in, just like we did back in the days of that campfire, and allow those stories to happen, allow people to speak clearly on what has happened to them because so many people have so many traumatic experiences. They really do. Getting back to the Bigfoot conference where I'll be speaking, one of the reasons why I agreed to go was because there are all sorts of people who will be speaking from different genres of the subject. And we're not there to beat each other's brows down because our points of view are different. No, it's about encouraging people to speak. Because your story is important, my story is important, and everybody else is listening. Their stories are important as well. You own your experiences. You're not going to remember each and every one, and that's okay. Most of us just remember parts of it, the parts that affected us and stained our brain because it happened. We know we're telling the truth. We know we're not trying to pull the wool over people's eyes for 15 minutes of fame for maybe a shot at a conference or maybe a little bit of clickbait on YouTube and Twitter and every other social media platform. No, it isn't about that. Most experiencers don't even care about that. What they care about is trying to figure out why this happened to them. Why were they lucky or unlucky enough to have an encounter with a Sasquatch, to find big footprints in their garden, to find the fact that their dog will not go outside at a certain time each and every night because the dog who's never been afraid of anything 
all of a sudden has a fear of going outside. Yes, there's all sorts of situations out there that we have to be careful of. And we only can hope that we are able to continue to to bring the strength that it takes to have these stories come alive. We want these stories to come alive. We need them to come alive because that gives us the clues of where to start, where to begin, where to end. And it gives us the strength to speak up even louder when we have something absolutely amazing happen to us. And for those of you who are on the fence of ever telling your story, we understand you have to do it for you. It's not about us. It's not about a radio show. It's not about a blog on Reddit or anything like that. No, it's about you feeling comfortable in your own skin and telling your story to people who may have had a similar encounter and may be refreshed enough in the subject to help you guide your way to figuring out what's going on. And that is your Dave 101. Let's get to the news. What time is it? It's time for Shirky Poo's News! All right, let's get to the news, shall we? Yep, and here we go. After spending countless years incarcerated and only having prison chow to tide you over, you think the majority of death row inmates would have their final meal order all sorted out in advance. Well... This dude's dietary requests should serve as a cautionary tale to any other death row inmate. And that is, what he asked for was so ridiculous, the prison officials refused and saddled him with a pot of plain yogurt instead. Have you ever thought about that, honestly? If you were on death row, if you could have your last meal, what would you have? So, James Edward Smith wasn't given any choices after... The ridiculousness. The convicted killer, who was 37 years old, was slapped with a death sentence after being found guilty of fatally shooting a man in Houston, Texas. It was March 1983 when Smith committed the event. And yeah, wasn't a nice man. Was not a nice man. So he goes to his date where he wants to literally have his last meal. He wants to eat soil. He doesn't want a steak and lobster. Doesn't want a big bowl of pasta. No SpaghettiOs. No chunky soup. No McDonald's. No Taco Bell. No Wendy's. Nothing. Except soil. Yep. Texas Department of Criminal Justice turned it down because dirt was not included on the approved foods list they refused his repeals he expressed his wishes to die and his hunger for the dirt to be his last meal they said no you get some yogurt instead how fun is that let's get to another one here a woman who allegedly posed as a dentist left people in worse shape than before they went in according to authorities Monica Davis, who had been touted her her business, the Veneer Experts on social media, is now under investigation for allegedly scamming several patients. Davis had already been charged with operating without a license in Las Vegas. Of course, it happens in Vegas. But according to a new accusation, she continued to see patients in Illinois with brutal consequences. Davis touted her dental business on TikTok as changing lives one smile at a time. Monica Bailey, a patient who visited Davis with her 15-year-old daughter, alleged she was fitted with fake braces. Bailey underwent the procedure less than two weeks after Davis was released from custody in Nevada. It's hard. It is, she said. I'm just hoping that we can have a positive outcome. Bailey alleged that Davis cleaned my teeth and started, you know, putting the glue on and putting the brackets on for the braces. And I thought what she was doing was how it's supposed to be done. But when she tried to contact the so-called dentist for a follow-up appointment, one number was disconnected while no one answered a second. It's crazy that she could do this in Vegas, post-bail, come to Illinois and do the exact same thing. It's like you have no fear. 
Ralph Jones, another patient, claims the $2,000 veneers Davis gave him started falling out, and he has no idea what was actually put inside his mouth. Jones explains, they just started decaying and falling out, and over the course of the years, it just started making my appearance look pretty bad. Davis is scheduled to appear in the Las Vegas court in May. No word if she will brush her teeth beforehand. Hmm. Bad dentist. An American-born billionaire who vanished in the Swiss Alps six years ago may have faked his own death and is now living with a mistress in Russia. Oh, my. This is soap opera-ish. Carl Erevan Hobb, who went missing on April 7, 2018, while training for a ski tour on Switzerland's Matterhorn Mountain, he was the CEO and part owner of Tengelman Group, a German-based company that manages a string of grocery, home improvement, and discount stores. A search of the area over the next six days didn't turn up any evidence of the 58-year-old. His younger brother, Christian, took control of the company 10 days after he went missing. At the time of his disappearance, Hobb had a net worth of $6.4 billion. Yeah. He was declared legally dead by a German court three years later on May 14th, 2021. However, German broadcast network RTL claims to have evidence that Hobb, who would be 64 now, is living in Moscow with a 44-year-old Russian woman named Veronica Ermelova. Oh, this is spicy. Very spicy. There's strong indication that he could have caused his own disappearance intentionally. As far as I know, the photos were obtained on behalf of Christian Hobb and two internal investigators working for him by an Israeli-American company that searched the biometric surveillance system in Moscow for images of Carl. Well, they may have found him. question is, is he wanted dead or alive? That is your news as we say thank you for all of you tuning us in tonight on Spaced Out Radio. What a great show it was. As we say hello to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal. Rockin' in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rockin' us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god itself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, the Space Travelers Club, and on X. Hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio, SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. The seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. All right. Good show. Good job, people. Very good job. You did well tonight. Yeah, you did. Lex Diaz, how you doing? Mindy filtered. What does Mindy unfiltered? Is she any different? Is Mindy filtered different than Mindy unfiltered? Now I need to know. Moody Mongol. Tets, how you guys doing? Oh, my knees are killing me.
Mhm. Yes, nine Huskers on X. I will be in Nebraska. Actually, looking forward to it. I like being places I've never been. Hey, it's sweet Roddy Martin right there. Look at that. My beautiful twin, sweet Roddy Martin. If I put a red hat on, you'd never tell us apart. We'd stymie the world. We don't use that word enough anymore. Remember the days where we used to use words like stymie? No, that's one of the ones that's fallen by the wayside. Now, did, uh, did she tell us? Did she tell us? I'm waiting. I still don't see it. Still don't see it. She's not telling us, people, what the unfiltered look looks like. Exactly, Paramarv. Exactly. It's enough to get you stymied. You know what word I hate? I think is really overused in today's... It, it was mainly used a few years ago by people who wanted to, like, sound smart is the word egregious. Can't stand that word. I cannot stand that word, egregious. It's, I mean, it doesn't even, it's not even a pleasant sounding word. Okay. Not even a pleasant sounding word. I remember there was one sportscaster who I couldn't stand in Vancouver. Okay. And he would use the word egregious at least three to four times every half an hour. I was like, how? How? Paul Nicholas, how you doing? I will carry the CPAP onto my plane, Sandra Kincaid, I promise you. Sandra Kincaid would literally come to Nebraska and kick my ass if I forgot it. Then after a good ass kicking, she would, you know, probably throw some cord at me and then step on the plane and fly home. All within like 18 minutes. Vanessa, I thought you were going to bed. You already said good night. Still hate that word egregious. Don't like it. Doesn't even roll off the tongue, nice. Terrible, terrible word.
face down. Yeah, that's the one right there. It's right there. That weekend host on SORs After Hours. One handsome dude. One handsome dude. Packing that bright red chin hair. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Yeah, I just got my hair cut done yesterday. Another statement I hate. I hate it when people are always, and I'm glad we're, that society's starting to get out of it, but when people were using the saying, let's go for everything, oh, you got a new bike, let's go. You got a new pair of shoes, let's go. Your underwear looks great tonight, let's go. I don't know where that came from, but that saying sucks. It does. There you go, just for you. Hi, Outer Space Doll Face. Welcome to our chat. Good evening, guys. Let's go. Oh, God. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Hey, Major Lee. I wish I could breathe out of my nose, man. Oh, I appreciate that outer space doll face. I like that. Literally had to come on in here to bust my balls. That's right. What an egregious move. Oh, it's Pinder, it's Pinzer No Flactum. That's who that is. What happened to the Flactum? 
Are we not flactuming anymore? Did we change our flactum to flac die? Did it become plural? Oh, yeah, then you know what I'm talking about. You, Major Lee, you know exactly what I'm talking about, about the broken schnoz then. Why I have a nice whistle, a dulcet whistle. See, like you you take a word like dulcet, that's a nice, it, it flows off the tongue nicely, you know? Okay, thank you, Sandra Kincaid. Flactum is still a nickname, but I feel like, but I just feel. Mm. So, this is one of these situations here where, where uh, she doesn't feel like a flactum anymore. She's flack die. She's gone plural on us. David Lopez, how you doing, buddy? Hope you're having a good evening. She's just a little pinzerish right now. I do like the outer space doll face. That works too. Puck Elf, I agree with you. We need more Corneliuses in this world. You know, the problem is when you shorten it, most people go to corny. At least in my area, people who were named Cornelius, their parents called them corny instead. <clears throat> yeah, that's why, uh, you know, speaking of which, that's why when when Merle told me his middle name was Merle, his real his first name is Michael, Mike, and then he started going. Told me his middle name was Merle. I'm like, dude, you got to use that shit. And he fought it for a long time. Like he used to get really pissed off about it. He did. You don't know the hell I took over that. And he's like, dude, people are messaging me on social media and calling me Merle now. I'm like, yeah. I said it's making you stick out. How many Mikes are in the paranormal world? How many Merles are in the paranormal world? And when I broke it down for them that way, he actually got more comfortable. Not that he's embarrassed by his name, because the name Merle is pretty badass. It is. It's a badass name. But he just needed to find out. And now he doesn't mind being called Merle. Thinks it's funny how many people call him Merle now. <sighs> Pardon me. Exactly. Exactly, Major Lee and Flack Die. Hey, fl pins are Flack Die. You know how you tell male Flack Die from female Flack Die? It's because of the Flacticles. Flacticles. I went there. You're welcome. I'm only here for another couple of minutes. 
Uh, Paramarv, not only is it a good hazing, but he actually enjoys it. He, he really does. It actually means a lot to him. Flacticles. Have, come on, there's got to be more laughing than that out there. There's a bunch of you in the chat room right now. Somebody's going to be busting my ass on social media. Now, Dave used the term flacticles, making fun of a lady's name. No. You can use that one too. Oh, nice woo poo. Kind of UFO did you see? Dangling flacticles. That's right. Beautiful, Major Lee. Unidentified flactical orbs. I like it. I don't want to appear egregious, but I'm rushing around cooking breakfast. Hard to chat and interact. This message costs one egg plus oil fire. <laughs> That's right, Susan Alloway. <clears throat> That's right. Jackrabbits with dangling flacticles. Come on, some of you share with me the, the words that you hate. And you know what? Stay away from moist, because everybody hates the word moist. If you ever want to try something funny, I'm going to let you in on my stupid humor here. Okay. I'm going to let you in here a little bit. Dave doesn't normally do this. Every time somebody around me gets hurt, I'll say really loud in public when I'm with them. How's your gout flare going? Yeah. Try it sometime. Just right in public. Say to your friend, hey, you're limping a little bit. You got your gout flare in there? Oh, yeah. Because number one, yes, people who have gout, it hurts like hell. Let's just be honest here. But we're allowed to make fun of people every now and again. Because... It's fun, and we need to loosen up a little bit. But seriously, if you ever, ever want to really, you know, embarrass your friend, and most, and the best part about it is, like, most of your friends will not know what gout is. You just right in the middle of a shopping mall or whatever, or you run into them and, you know, at a lounge or at a restaurant. How's your gout doing? Flaring up here or what? You have to make me angry for my brain to fire up big words. Yeah. Thank you, Tets. I don't eat breakfast, only dinner. You should never eat breakfast for, for dinner. 
Okay. You never want to have breakfast for dinner. There's just something morally wrong and challenged with that. All right. Get the old uh, update here for a second. Any Canadians still left in the chat room? Any Canadians here? Hi, Paisley Park. Hi, Dave. Was it hockey pucks to the face that broke it? Oh, no, it was punching. Um, but I had fun. I did have a lot of fun. Bakersfield Nugget? No, from Buck Owens, Merle Haggard. Corn and Skunk Work secretly assembled the U2 here for winter. Oh, very cool. High necessary dialogue. That's some power waving there. The hell is Canadian ham? Hi, Mama Susan. I'm just seeing, did, did, did you see what Dear Leader put on there, on out on Twitter today? That since 2019, he is responsible for the majority of Canadians having their cell phone bills cut in half. I want to know whose cell phone bill that is, because mine are freaking expensive. Yeah, dear leader saying, oh, yeah, I'm responsible for this. I don't even refer to him as as his uh, name anymore. It's just dear leader. Just works easier that way. If you dear leader him, it's true. Also on social media, I'm afraid to say his name. Here's his tweet. We've cut the cost of cell phone plans in half since 2019, in part by increasing competition. Next, we're going to after junk fees on your phone bill so you could do things like cancel your plan or switch to a cheaper one with no added charges. My phone bill's gone up. Yeah, Rob G., I knew there was something sickening about you eating pancakes for dinner. Rob, this is going to say a lot about our friendship, but do you butter your pancakes or do you just go straight syrup? Because I don't understand the buttering thing. Kind of pisses me off, to be honest. Shaq Filet, how you doing, my man? Good morning to you. It is pretty sad, though. Honestly, it is pretty sad that more people are not understanding that if you say dear leader's name, 
Uh, I will have a ticket for you. Flacticals, I will have a ticket for you. You will let you in. Oh, I totally laughed, Joe Bunk. I totally laughed. <laughs> really? 20 pounds a month for unlimited everything on your cell phone plan? I think my cell phone is like $110 a month. It's so with like 50. fifty gigs of internet space or whatever the hell that term is. You have a bunch of friends here, so you don't need to bring your friend. It's not a phone a friend type contest, but your health is kind of important. But we'll make you feel good. We will. I'm going to go eat some ice cream or snack out. I'm in the North Valley. What the hell is the North Valley? Oh, Sacramento. Hold on. Yeah. So in Sacramento, you head east on the highway to Reno. Reno is like, what, two hours away? How far is... Sacramento to Reno. Two hours, 22 minutes. I didn't know Sacramento was more south than Reno. I love Fallon. Fallon, they got a big naval base there. Lots of jets. Oh, I could, I could totally live by a military base. I totally could. could totally live by a military base. Listen to the fighters come in and out. Oh, just beautiful. Just beautiful. It really is. Uh, Paramarv, that's my line. Uh, no, that's just my line, not my family lines. My cell phone bill for, I have four phones on my bill. And I am paying, like, after taxes, 500 a month. So it's about $125 a line. Brutal. Who's on tomorrow night? Allison Gray is on tomorrow night. Spiritual guidance with her. She's a medium. We're going to have some fun. Thank you tonight to Tim, Sasquatch, Deb, Joe, W. Decker, Chris, and Human Carl for the Super Chats. We will see you all tomorrow. All tomorrow. See you then, uh, everybody.
Stay healthy, my friend. You too. If you need bail money, give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.